time haven't arrived, councilors, I'm going to hereby call the Finance Committee meeting for Wednesday, September 20th, 2017, it being 7 p.m. Before we get into the agenda item, I do uh, have a couple um, housekeeping. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Councilor Lally and Councilor Yanieri for uh, great results just in the preliminary. And uh, for those that are watching here on TV, uh, it wasn't a good turnout citywide. On November 7th is a general election, and everybody except for Councilor Barnes, Councilor Stanensky will not be appearing on the ballot, um, those two individuals. But we do thank Shana and Paul for your many years of service, and we'll continue to do so until the end of the year. Councilors, a um, couple of pieces of information. I did get an email um, this afternoon, 3.03 uh, .03 p.m., uh, from Attorney Benjamin Albanese. Hello, I regret to inform you that I have a pressing family matter to attend this evening. It will not be available for tonight's meeting. I've submitted copies of all my files to the council previously for the August meeting. All pertinent information should be in that submission. Hopefully any additional information can be supplied by Marty Brophy. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Best you wishes. Can. Mike's not on. Sorry. Sorry. Not on. So this is the this is the list. Yeah. No, yes, it is. Is there a plug on there? That's why I got a highlighter. Okay. Are there two daily roads? That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there there are there a fuse box? <laughs> daily road. Constance, we'll move on. You want to move on, Constance? Take a vote on this. Want to move on relative to having no audio tonight? Yeah, we're gonna have to. Yes. Yeah. matter internally everyone can hear me anyways but I think it was very very disheartening dis distasteful to have my name put on a street sign with the city seal which is an abuse to the city seal had in contact the city clerk after one of my other good colleagues called contacted me and indicated what had occurred and when I got him on the phone and indicated what what had transpired and I had gone up there myself I'd called him from that location to see what what it looked like and he said who allowed somebody to use the seal because the city seal has to be authorized to be used by the city clerk and even through the city council so with that being said and despite what had transpired it took my other steps to make sure that it was resolved and the sign was removed my concern still lies with who made the sign using the city seal I know we, we still make signs within house. We also still send to a company to have a sign company that makes them. So I will keep pursuing to whom, because I want to know whom, and I think the city wants to know who. People in Water 3 want to know who, 
And they're very disenchanted with the whole situation in itself, especially the people that live within that area that are opposed to that project and will continue to be opposed to that project. It's just something tasteless and childish. But the fact of the matter is that somebody's abusing the city seal. And, and if another sign does go up, I'll pursue that further in whatever direction I have to go. I will continue to take it. That's no, I have no problem with that whatsoever. But still, it's the first time I have to say in all the many years, counselors, and I've been involved in many campaigns, that it's been a really an eye-opener to what we have in, in, some, in, in some cases of, of how the whole political process has been working over these last several months. And I find that to have been very, very distasteful, very disheartening, still against the law to even use my name without even anyone asking me. So uh, with that being said, it's, it's still gonna, I'm still going to pursue it. And somebody should come forward and say, I made it, and I used the seal and had no right to do so. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Thank Councilor Yanary. Madam Clerk, we're going to go on to the agenda. Item number one, please. Okay. <clears throat> the appointment of Kenneth Galligan, 25 Messina Drive, Brockton, Massachusetts, to the Traffic Commission pursuant to City of Brockton Ordinance Section 466 for a term of three years. Invited, Kenneth Galligan. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good evening, Councilors. Thank you for being here. Do you have a statement for the committee? Yeah, I look forward to serving another term of three years on the Traffic Commission. Mr. Chairman. Council Cruz. I'd just like to take a minute to, uh, and I'm glad the microphones are on in the city to hear this, but the chief is the epitome, and I, I, I try not to call him the chief because the, 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 the current chief is sitting there, but the chief is the epitome of what public service is all about for this city. He cares. We all deal with, we dealt with him as a, as a fire chief, and he was an exemplary leader. We deal with him on two city boards, and he is a man of integrity, in public, the, the definition of public service, and I'd just like to take a minute on behalf of the people of Ward 1, and he is a constituent of mine, to thank you for all that you've done through these years, and, and thank you for still being there to serve and lead these boards that you uh, serve on. So thank you. That's all. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, to approve. Thank you, Second. Council. Small motion on the floor, uh, properly seconded to uh, make a favorable recommendation back to the council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Uh, that's a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Agenda item number two, please. Reappointment of Morton Schlepper, 60 Irma Drive, Brockton, Massachusetts, to the Traffic Commission pursuant to City of Brockton Ordinance Section 466 for a term of three years. Invited Morton Sch Schlepper. Councils, we did re receive uh, an email from Mr. Schlepper um, a few days ago, actually. It might have been late last week. He could not make it tonight. He had a prior engagement. He apologized. Move to approve. Second. Second. So motion on the floor, properly second. Favorable recommendation back to the council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full council. Number three, please. Order. Appropriation of $500 from Enbridge Foundation to City of Brockton Fire Department Enbridge Foundation Grant Fund. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, G Chief Financial Officer, Michael F. Williams, Chief Brockton Fire Department. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Councilors. This is a $500 grant that we've received for the past several years. It used to be received by a company named Spectre Energy and now it's been changed to Enbridge Company. That's a crew. Second. Just like to say, Chief, you are the, the current chief, but I just can never stop calling him chief, so <laughs> thank you very much Happens and second the motion. Back. Once you have that title, you have it for life. That's right. There's a motion on the floor, property second, a favorable recommendation back to full council. All in favor, raise your hand. I'll oppose that motion carries. Thank you, chief. Thank you. Favorable <laughs> recommendation back to full council. Before we go on, I neglected to say Councilor Shirley Azak unfortunately couldn't attend tonight. Uh, but she did want to go on record saying she had, had a family engagement. She couldn't participate tonight. She will be here Monday night. Number four, please. Order. Transfer of $20,000 from fiscal, uh, fiscal year 18 budget of cemetery for ordinary maintenance of goods and supplies to cemetery personal services other than overtime. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Timothy Carpenter, Superintendent Cemetery. Good evening, Mr. Carpenter. Good evening, Councils. Do you have a statement or? I don't. This would be uh, the money required to uh, have the current part-time secretary's uh, position be a full-time position. Okay. Motion That's for favor, recommendation. Question. Second. Not so much a question. I just want to, uh, I, to bring to everyone's attention that this is an item that we had discussed during the budget process, and I was very strong on hopefully having it uh, reinstated. So I, I know uh, Mr. Condon was here that particular night, and, and we discussed it, and, and obviously went back and discussed it further with the mayor. So it, it's happening. So I, I just want to you know, thank all of those involved to make sure that it has happened, and, and you know what you have to do from this point. So appreciate it very much. Thank you. 
So motion is properly seconded, correct? Who made the motion? Yep. Who seconded? Uh, motion on the floor, properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. It's a favorable recommendation back to council. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Going to go on to uh, number five, please. Order that the name, naming of Somerset Place also be known as Reverend Nathaniel E. Williams Place. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Councillor Shana Barnes. Councillor Barnes. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, my uh, colleagues, I spoke with my family about this and let them know what transpired the last time. And they went into, I guess, caucus and um, they've come back and they've asked that this measure actually be tabled until further notice. There are some other things that they want to look at. Um, with some, some naming of some private property uh, that, they, that we have uh, in his honor that might be a, a little more significant um, and, and uh, sentimental. So they've asked that um, we table this. So I guess I make a motion, make a motion to table to this. So motion made was second to table. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that matter is hereby tabled. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Number six, please. Order. In reference to Article 3, Section 2-110, City of Brockton Ordinance <coughs> Waiver of Residency, invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Philip <coughs> C. Nesrala, Solicitor, John Crowley, Chief, Brockton Police Department, Patrick Benby. Good evening. Good evening, State your name for the record, please. Uh, Patrick Benby. I don't have any statement uh, other than to thank you guys for your time and consideration in this matter. Thank you. Uh, Council Fowell, please. Uh, colleagues, I, what I have to say has nothing to do with Mr. Benvey. It's strictly going to relate to collective bargaining language, and, uh, and I don't want any of my comments to think that it reflects on Mr. Benvey or his family. Uh, when this came in, I was concerned, and I did some research, and the, the police contract specifically states that all employees initially hired on and after January 1st, 1996 shall be subject to Section 2-110 of the Residency Ordinance. Effective January 1st, 2006, such employees shall be subject to said ordinance only for a period of seven years from and after the first day of paid employment as a member of the bargaining unit. So while I can understand that we might someday have employees who perhaps work for the school department, they take the civil service test and they become police officers. This issue is very clearly spelled out in the collective bargaining agreement and I think for us to negate that, for us to decide that we're going to supplant a decision here in a political body for the collective bargaining language that has been agreed to would be very wrong. And I'm, I'm told that actually the employees, I think Officer Healy is here. I think the employees are actually told that it's, it's from the first day of paid employment for that bargaining unit, namely the police patrolmen. The other issue of financial hardship, I, I just don't think we can get into a means testing here about who should be given residency, a, a residency waiver based on certain financial conditions. I mean, good Lord, I, uh, is it going to come down to us having to examine bank accounts, tax returns, and yes, you qualify and you don't. I, I just don't think it's something that this body should get involved with. But I do think, I do think that it's clearly something that perhaps should be raised in the collective bargaining setting. Uh, and, and there may be other unions who have the exact same language. So that if we were to do something, we might open up the floodgates to, uh, to people asking for similar consideration. So for all of those reasons, this counselor is not in favor of it. Doesn't have anything to do with Mr. Benvey, but it does have everything to do with collective bargaining, setting a precedent, perhaps opening up Pandora's box to other employees who might feel that they're in the same situation and would want a, uh, a waiver granted. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fowell. Councilor Cruz, followed by <coughs> Councilor Bonds, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just, and again, not on this specific issue, but I believe, and perhaps uh, Mr. Nasrallah could correct me if I'm wrong, also specifically in the collective bargaining agreement is that there is the opportunity for a waiver only through the City Council, through a request of the Mayor and a, yeah, and a, uh, uh, a vote of this, uh, this body. It is in the collective bargaining agreement. I believe, uh, Council uh, Attorney Nezrell, am I wrong on that? Uh, and just historically, and again, I'm not speaking about this in particular case, we have, this body has approved certain other for safety reasons, for, for different reasons in the past. 
uh, and again, we're the only ones that can approve a, a waiver. You correct me if I'm wrong? If I may, I, I think your interpretation is correct. Council Farwell is correct that if the collective bargaining agreement, if it does not meet the collective bargaining agreement, it can be uh, approached as under one of the three exceptions under the residency law. And if he doesn't meet those three exemptions, the, the council will act accordingly. If he did meet one of those three, then it's still uh, within the discretion of the city council. Thank you, but I'm not sure you, you answered. Is it specifically in the collective bargaining agreement or in the ordinance for the, so it is specifically mentioned Correct. in that union's collective bargaining agreement, and it's also in the ordinance for the uh, residency requirement, correct? That's correct. Thank Su you. It's subject to the ordinance, which is, is relatively clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Council Bonds, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know if everybody else received uh, a letter or some sort of explanation to what this request is even fo is founded on. I, I know that the other times that some of the police officers have asked for a, a waiver, there's usually a letter or some sort of explanation as to why some safety issue, financial hardship, or something of that nature. I didn't receive one. Is there one available? Did any members of the committee receive a letter? I, I did believe, not. I, I believe we did a couple did. of months ago. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we did, but I don't have it anymore, but it was about two months ago. I believe we, we did receive one. Madam Clerk, do, we, yeah. do you know Mr. That? Chairman, just a point of clarification, and, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but the issue was prior work for the city of Brockton, okay. which the employee wanted counted towards the exemption from residency. Yes, that's right. And financial hardship in that apparently there would be increased daycare costs if the person isn't allowed to move out of the city. So it was based on those two, those two issues. Thank you, Councillor. So am I to assume that the accrued time and the time on the, in the department add up to the seven years, or is it still s insufficient? Okay, I, I thank was you. I was hired by the school department in November of 2009. In 2013, I took a job with the police. Okay, so it is over so seven. November of this year will be eight years. So you were a school police officer? No, I was a custodian. Custodian, okay. Oh, okay. So oh nine to now is what? Oh, eight years. Yes, in November it'll be eight years. I see. Oh, okay. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Benby? Entertain a motion. I'm going to move favorable recommendation in the hope that it does not prevail. I'll second. I'll second that for the vote. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Say that again. I'm going to move favorable recommendation in the hope that it does not prevail. Basically, that it doesn't pass. It, it doesn't pass. Second again. It's either. You can only make a motion in a positive manner. That doesn't manner. sound right. <laughs> Uh, There's a motion on the floor, uh, favor recommendation back to the council, full council. It was properly seconded. All in favor of sending it back favorable to the full council, please raise your hand. Please put them up high. Madam Clerk, you get the. Yeah. And all uh, that want to send it back unfavorable or not, not uh, favorable to the full council, please raise your hand. You got that, Madam Clerk? Yes. Mr. Chairman, could I request, though, that, and because I do recall seeing a letter, that we get another copy of the letter before next Monday's meeting? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. We'll have a letter before Monday. E email is copy is fine. Thank, Thank you. you. And Madam yeah, Clerk, you the letter in my mailbox. You got the vote. Yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. <laughs> Mr. Benby, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councils, that was actually deemed favorable back to the full council. We're going to go on to the next agenda item, please. Resolve. Be it resolved that the City Council requests that the City of Brockton's real estate custodian, Mr. Benjamin Albanese, the City Treasurer, Mr. Brophy, and the Mayor appear, appear before the Finance Committee to provide a complete listing of what properties have been sold since his appointment. The schedule of the auction hearings, past, current, future. A full listing of properties currently listed is available. Yeah. The amount of money raised, submitted to the general account, and any other information pertinent to the information referenced above. 
invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Benjamin Albanese, Real Estate Custodian, Martin S. Brophy, Treasurer Collector. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Evening, Councillors. Here, Mr. Brophy. Council Barnes, this is yours, correct? Yes, thank you. And I don't, I don't know if we should uh, try again with Mr. Albanese to make sure that everybody is here. I know that was one of the problems last time, but I mean, as the real estate custodian, I think it's important to have him here. But I, because I wanted to ask, I, I mean, oh, hold on. Let me try to ask you, Mr. Brophy, first. Oh. The reason why I even thought about this was um, it had come before real estate a few times that several properties uh, were uh, coming up as surplus that may not have been surplus. Some people ha have um, gone through the auction process and then come to find out it was un an unbuildable lot and they, we've had to refund money. So all of those things I was just really concerned about. And we would never, I, I know that I believe it was uh, Council Borgard, I think, may have asked Mr. Albanese for a full accounting of all of the monies that we've collected so far and, and all of those, the, the funds transactions. So that was really the impetus of, of all of this. And I, do you have those records or would he have those records? And um, I, I keep a spreadsheet based of the auctions. He would actually have all the documentation I as figured. to what <clears throat> the high bids were. Um, that money is receded by the treasurer's office though. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, um, you know, based on the historical amounts received in, uh, the two point million, little over, I think, is an accurate figure. Okay, so since it started and since when fiscal fourteen. Okay, so we've we've receded a little over two million dollars. How About much have o over two point four? Two point okay, two and a half almost. So how much has been returned to folks? Um, from misrepresentations anything, or <clears throat> there's only one property I believe that has been accepted back by the city. And that was based on, it had a 48 foot frontage and was not a buildable lot. Uh, that's the only one. Wilmington Street was the only one that's been accepted back by the city. Now some people have defaulted on their the purchase, in which case we've kept the $5,000 deposit. So defaulting on it or a property not selling is one thing, but actually selling a property, closing on it, and taking it back one. Okay, so when somebody defaults, say that I, I do this, say I go to the auction, I have my $5,000, and then I Action. default because um, hmm. I, some, something the with funding. the land wasn't disclosed or something, and I just forfeit my money. Like, how, do we keep track of that? Uh, it would be receded in with that money. Well, no, not, not the money. I'm talking about like the, the reasons for the land untaking, I guess. I, I don't believe there'd be a reason as to why I, I mean, okay, because it, the, it the can vary. I, I mean, some people. I, I know in one of the one of the first auctions, the person bought a house and saw the condition of it and walked away because see, of the work that would be needed. Yeah, that, but that's, I mean, that's part of my question. There are various reasons why some people might not be able to get the funding. But see, that's that's kind of part of of what this is too. So I, I'm assuming that when people come to these auctions, um, they're told certain things or maybe uh, some of the properties are presented a certain way and then after we get their money all of a sudden it's either a money pit or it, it's some kind of um, I don't want to say bait and switch but it's late and I don't really have any other words but it's kind of baity switchy so I, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out how, how do people know exactly what they're buying is there any prior communication to all of these things so that we don't have these kinds of things like I, I bought this house thinking I, mean, I can renovate it and then I come to find out it's you know the properties my understanding is that they're sold as is so I mean but is there any disclosure that you know maybe all the copper was stripped out or no no it's sold as is I mean when I was a real estate custodian uh -huh. I didn't enter a property we secured a property that was it but it wasn't, you didn't go in there and inspect it to see whether it, the house could be rehabbed or whether it needed to be torn down. You sold it as is. And those are like the rules and stuff? And that's, that's I, I mean, the city's not going to do any work on the property. No, no, I'm not saying I, to I do mean, any work. I'm just saying that. I, I, I think th part of the thing is people who, the contractors who would be bidding on these would realize that there's work to be done on mm -hmm. and they will bid accordingly. So if they feel that it's going to cost them $100,000, mm -hmm. then they'll bid accordingly on the property. 
Right. It, it's just, I'm, I'm just saying, just the perception is that in the beginning, some of the properties were um, better kept up or, or they were some of the more premium properties that, you know, folks can kind of either turn around quickly or do whatever they were going to do with them. And as the years have gone on, these three years, $2.4 million later, a lot of the Don't properties are now the not as, as advertised or e even as is advertised. I mean, that they're just really, really in horrible shape and that folks are getting duped. That's the perception. Well, again, so that's what I was wanting to know. You're also selling a lot of land was sold. Land? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, but but some people were. Um, I I've heard that some people were concerned that a lot of the land that they w purchased that all of a sudden is some sort of unbuildable lot. But you said there was only one that was returned. Correct. But in actuality, because we don't really track it, it could have been one of those defaulters that just kind of you know gave up their five grand that they found out later that the the property was unbuildable. Mr. President, perhaps I can shed a little bit of light on it for the Councilor, if I may. Okie doke. A lot of the issues don't necessarily arise over the physical structure, the building itself. Uh -huh. It may be relative to the quality of the title of the land. <laughs> yes. For instance, as Mr. Brophy stated, on Wilmington Street, there was 48-foot frontage. There's a requirement of 50-foot frontage. Some lots are undersized, but they're grandfathered. Some lots have, have easements on them. Some have right-of-ways. For the city to make disclosures as to whether or not you can use them for certain purposes is opening up a whole Pandora's box of not only obligations on behalf of the city, but representations as to the quality of the title, far beyond what a municipality normally does. So where these properties are advertised for auction purposes, mm -hmm. the prospective buyer has an opportunity to do exercise due diligence by going out and doing a title exam, looking at a plot plan, making their own determination if this property will be fit for the purpose they're looking to buy it for. Maybe to have a garden and they don't care if it's buildable or not buildable, but whatever the function is that they want, they have that opportunity to check the records in the building department and to make a determination with their own personal attorney if it will suit their purpose. That saves the city an awful lot of liability from making representations that this property will be good for A, B, C, or D. We should not be doing that, and I think that's what Mr. Brophy is, is trying to represent. Okay. All right. That's fair, and, and I understand that, and I think that's where our, I'm, I'm projecting that that's where a lot of the confusion came, um, that this even came about, like I said to me, is that people, I, I think people may have assumed or may have uh, interpreted some exchange about these properties or, or land that ended up not being, uh, being true in, in their, you know, uh, uh, assertion. But my other question, too, thank you, um, Mr. Nasrallah. When are these auctions? I, I know it was the, you know, the big splash in the paper that they were having it, you know, a couple of days and that, that kind um, of fell off and... Excuse me, there was one in April of 2014. One in May of 2014, August 2014, October of 2014, May of 2015, October of 2015, April 2016, January 2017, May 2017, and that was the final one. So less than now. 10. So very, very few. What's that? Very few, I guess. I mean, there were a lot in 2014, but then it, it weaned as the years went on. Well, yeah, I mean, but there hadn't been one prior to 2014 since I believe it was either 2010 or 2011. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't know that. I know that now, but I'm just saying, I mean, the way that the program was reintroduced it was just kind of this big deal, this big thing, and you know. Again, when it, in 2007, it came back to the treasurer's office. We held an auction in 2007, 2009, 2010, and 2011. At that point, the influx of sellable properties kind of dried up. Okay. It was one that we were planning probably in 2013 and it just kind of never happened uh, timing wise as treasurer I just couldn't get it done uh, so that was that was almost really the first one in April of 2014 okay okay and now this list here that was on the desk these are the available properties as it stands right now today that's the tax possession list 
I mean, that is what properties that could be put up for auction. I see. Again, those are numbers on a piece of paper. And okay. if it's under 5,000 square feet, it really falls into the abutters lot program. Okay. Th that's the minimum size lot statewide that could be sold as a buildable lot. Mr. Brophy, on that point for the committee, can you explain this? Thank you, first of all, for providing it. Sure. Um, but quite honestly, I, I, I looked at it, I was a little confused on some of it uh, relative to dates of taking that are left blank, dollar balances. If you could explain that and we'll go sure. right Sure. I, I created this list probably back starting 2003. And at the time, there was a very small list on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I went to the assessor's office, got the list of what's considered city-owned properties. That includes everything, the buildings, the schools. Uh, went through the old records that the treasurers had, index cards of the tax possessions, and basically created a list. But the obvious ones that I knew were city use, I pulled off. Anything I couldn't find a card for, I put in there as a dollar and been doing research. Those numbers have been fluctuating as we see it's something that's city use or uh, was deeded to the city, we pull it out of there. But they were in there for a dollar just to make sure that there was a record of that's a city owned property and you know, I couldn't find anything. So these have all been approved by land court? Um, again, some of them I haven't found records on yet. Okay. So I don't have books and pages. I don't have, you know, it's hard to track some of these down because, I mean, obviously there's some that go back to the 40s and 50s. And I was yeah. able to find index cards on them. Yeah. So, I mean, where I could get a number, I did. Uh, and actually the number when I started this process was much higher on the ledger than what it wound up being after the list was completed. So we now reconcile to the ledger with an actual detailed list uh, as new stuff comes on, we put it in as a new taking with a date, a book and page, and we have a better record. As we sell, we take it off the list. So every month, if there's an auction, we take off and the property closes. If we foreclose, we add to it. So it's a monthly reconciliation that we do based on any activity. But there'd be some possible say you could never sell. Probably. Because you don't have titles. You don't have verified titles. I, I'd have to, that's where I'd get Attorney Coppola's office involved, my yep. legal counsel, and have him do the research. Okay. And in many ways, when it came back to the treasurer's office, that's how we compiled some lists. We verified all that information with them. They did a title search. They would have the records, some of them themselves. Thank you. Council Bonds, you have a floor. Thank you. Um, and thank you for asking for that clarification, because I'm, I'm looking here, too. So now... Right on here, Ralsco. Is that Ralsco Park that we just had the big Charlie to Taglia dedication to? Uh, what street is that one on? Bartlett. It's on page one. It's about... Yes. That was that property that was contaminated, it had been foreclosed. So that's one now that almost will have to be removed because it's now city use. It's okay, that, that was my question. So how, does, so how do you yeah. reconcile the... Yeah, no, I mean, you have to keep track of what's been going on. Too. Right. Okay. I mean, you know, it, it, between real estate or properties being deeded through uh, the city council or auctions and oncoming, if, if something has been determined to be a park use through a council order, you know, we have to kind of keep track of that. Okay. And I mean, again, you know, I'm just looking at this now, skimming through it. Any, any owners or um, folks on here that are city workers? Uh, have not these that properties? I know of. No? Okay. And so... Now, with all of these potential properties and, and uh, areas, land, how does Mr. Albany's kind of come in? Does he come in and take a look and kind of just, like, how does he figure out which ones go on the list for? Would have, you, um, I can't remember when the last time he, could, he took a list from me. Uh, he usually tries to keep it updated himself. He would actually go through and do some research on it to see whether it would be something that could be auctioned. Okay, and the, uh, just one more time, the last auction was when? Um, May of 17. May of 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. 17. Okay. All right, I think that's it for now. Thank you, Thank you, Chairman. Council. Thank Council you, Rodriguez, Brooke. followed by Council Cruz. <coughs> <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, one of my questions was basically just for, us, for you to walk us through the process how a, a property gets to uh, Mr. Albanese's possession. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to, one of the issues that I brought, and I think this is going back to 2014, uh, a lot of us sitting at, on, the, on this body have absolutely no idea when these um, auctions are taking place. 
And we were promised, because that's one of the questions that I had asked, because one of the things that I hear on a regular basis is that the average person has no idea when these properties are being, mm -hmm. being auctioned off. I mean, I hear we, you know, we advertise it here, we advertise it there, but you know what, if, the, if a city council asks me to provide him a list of properties that are being auctioned off, I think I'd provide him a list of properties that are being auctioned off. I understand, Councilor. I, I can't answer that for Mr. And I wish, I wish so. he was here because he promised me, because one of the issues that I raised with him was the fact that there's quite a few people from the ethnic communities that are not really in tune with the process, <laughs> but also they want to be part of the American process to, to, to become homeowners and all that. And he promised me that he would make available those, um, the, the, that list, or at least when he was doing that. I mean, it's... I understand. We're talking it, about an email. I what I can tell you is anyone who comes into the treasurer's office and is wondering when an auction is being held, um, we don't actually know ourselves until shortly before, probably like a month before as well. <clears throat> but he had set up a website, and we give them that website and say, you can go and register there in any auctions you'll be notified it's a place you can check so anybody who walks in or calls our office we're trying to provide information at least they can kind of keep register themselves as a person to be notified when an auction happens and to actually know where the website is beyond the city website we tell them to keep an eye on the city website but also you can check here but marty you know one of the things that i uh, mr brophy one of the things that i need to bring up i'm the chair of the real estate committee mm -hmm. Uh, and we're supposed to be custodians of city properties. You know, we but not tax possession. I know, but whatever belongs to the city, the taxpayers puts us he, put us here to determine and, and represent them in the best in the best use of their of their resources. So it's kind of a little uneasy in the sense when somebody says, "Oh, when's the next? Uh, when are you guys going to auction off a, a piece of property? Or when, when's the next auction?" For us to sit here and say we have no idea i mean it's whenever he feels like setting it up whenever he feels like like doing it we will know and, and to me that sounds like a chaotic way of doing things especially in 2017 when we're, we all have access to emails we all have access to uh i understand counselor that, but I, I mean no, that's not you'd have to ask talk to mr albanese about that well that's why i think at the end of this i'm actually going to make a motion that we take we we take uh, postpone this again and ask them to come back because this is just that important. Uh, you know what, no one's above the law in this city and no one should be above the law. And Mr. Albanese does not own the, the, the tax properties in this city, it's owned by the taxpayers. And these buildings are owned by taxpayers. And the taxpayers need to know when, what's going on with their property. And I, and I honestly believe that we should all be in the loop. It's not privileged information for a few. It should all be our information for us to share with our constituencies I'm and not with the taxpayers with in the you, city. I'm not disagreeing with you, yeah, but thank, I, I mean, it, I can't answer for him. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Brophy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Cruz, followed by Council Farwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually, uh, me. two comments, uh, really. Uh, number one, the first couple of auctions, and again, I know you can't speak to this first couple of auctions mr albanese did a great job of informing us talking to us and then they seem to just happen but i also uh, through you mr chairman to my colleagues uh, Councilor barnes and anybody else i think there's sometimes uh and these go back 20 25 years i've been i'm in the building trades and i think there's a misconception on what we have right here most of the buildings th there is no premium property that is ever 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 at an auction like this. Mm -hmm. There is basically no habitable house that is ever making it to an auction like this. The, uh, the people who are at these auctions regularly are the same seven or eight general contractors who know what they're looking at. They go and they look at these properties. They could tell you right now, most of those seven or eight contractors could tell uh, all of us right now what pieces of property and what buildings are out in the city that are worth bidding on. And when there is a default, almost always, it's because a builder took a flyer on it for $5,000. He's willing to eat that $5,000 because he got there and said, you know what, I can only sell this for two ten. It's going to cost me two forty to fix it. I'll, I'll eat my five and go. The, uh, the idea that there are houses out there that the public, and again, I think that's something that we need to be a part of letting the public know, 
don't get excited about that you're going to find the American dream here because these are the dregs of the pieces of property that generally make it so this far to the auction. And as a matter of fact, if you look at this, you know, this, there's got to be 30 pages here, I'm not even sure, of, of properties that you're showing us. 0.16 acres, 0 0.005 acres. Point, most of these are slivers of property that people walked away from, wouldn't pay their taxes on. Almost everything in this list, not everything, but almost everything in this list is not something we should be, actually, what we should be doing is contacting all these people if we had the manpower, contacting all of the abutters and making, say, make us an offer through the abutters program because that's all most of this property is good for almost all of it. And again, these general contractors who work in this realm of, of business, they know what's, what, how much it costs. They know, looking at a building, that there's no copper left in it, that the gutters are all been stolen. They know before they get to the auction. Again, I do want Attorney Albany to do a better job of reaching out to us and letting us know when the auctions are. But the idea that there are, that somebody is going to fulfill their American dream out of this auction is is a fallacy. It just those properties have long before either the bank took took them before that before we got to it. Uh, somebody didn't walk away for a five thousand dollar tax bill from a four hundred thousand dollar habitable house. Uh, am I wrong? Uh, you're correct. Uh, the other thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize is a, a vacant property, the house standing, usually isn't owned by the city but owned by a bank, and a lot of people come in thinking that there's a house, empty house on my street, and you know, when's the city gonna do something with it? The city doesn't actually own it. Half the time, the majority of the time, those aren't even delinquent taxes because the banks are paying the taxes. They're just not upkeeping the building. Thank you, I just wanna make that statement. Thank you. Thank you, just on, on what you said, Councilor Cruz, uh, that Mr. Attorney Albany needs to make a better reach out to, I mean, it's non-existent. <laughs> he doesn't do it, period. So, I mean, he can't enhance anything he doesn't do. <laughs> um, we're going to go to Mr. Fowler, followed by Mr. Lally. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Chairman, I would say that I, I hope we do continue this because I have some specific questions for, for, uh, for the real estate custodian. Uh, I was not going to get into this, this tonight, but since Councilor Cruz has offered some comments, uh, Maybe there is an American dream that turns up in the auction every once in a while. And I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you an example. 560 Warren Avenue, we put out an RFP to develop that piece of property. And there was a gentleman, a very well-known businessman, who wanted to locate a business there. He wanted to bid on the property. And before he had a chance to bid on it, the city called him and said, oh, time out. No, we're not going to get, we're not going to go through with the RFP. It turned up on the auction in May of 2017. Along came someone who bid on that property, and four months later, the deed hasn't been transmitted to him because, according to Mr. Alba, Attorney Albanese, he's doing his due diligence to check out the property. Now, I thought when you went to an auction, you had done your due diligence, you knew what you were bidding on, and you would bid accordingly, and you would make a payment and the city would receive the funds. But apparently we're allowing this person who makes campaign donations here in Brockton to take four months and decide whether he wants that piece of property or not. And that's one of the reasons why I want the real estate custodian in here. Do we make everyone aware that they're going to have four months to bid on a piece of property and then decide if they really want it? I hope we do because we did it for the person who is apparently intending to buy 560 Warren Avenue. Um, I'd like to digress for a minute and go to Attorney Nesrala and ask him a question uh, it, it, with, the, uh, with no objection. The, the real estate custodian, as I understand it, collects the money that is bid by the prospective purchaser and any monies that are owed for liens and 10 percent of the value of the property, excluding any liens, as his or her fee. Am I correct? No means. Council, the, the, the property is sold free and clear. City-owned property. No, I'm, I'm talking about a, two, a piece of property is sold at auction. It's bought for $200,000. Am I correct that 10 percent of that $200,000 goes to the real estate custodian for his fee? Because that's the documentation that was handed out to us some months ago 
with copies of actual transactions and a notation that a separate check has to be made out for 10 percent of the purchase price. Is that still done? That is a premium is on top of the, the bidded price. So, All right, so my question to the solicitor is why don't we do it in-house? Why don't we have an assistant city solicitor who also knows how to handle real estate transactions, who could also auction off the property, and I dare say you might be able to pay for the salary of that assistant city solicitor through the fees collected from the purchases of the property that's auctioned. Why, 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 are, we, uh, why are we doing it uh, externally? Well, I think we simply adopted a, a, an ordinance and a statute that had been on the books, and uh, we were looking to get these vacant properties and idle properties off the ground and get, them, uh, get money in the coffers. Uh, that issue there is more of a uh, management administration issue, uh, why we do it this way instead of that way. But, but it could be, if, if the city chose to do it in-house and have your department, which I, as you know, I'm a fan of the law department, hire an assistant city solicitor part-time to do that type of work, and then we collect as a community the 10% premium instead of having a private person do it, that is something that could be done under the law. Am I correct? Correct. All right. Now back to uh, Mr. Brophy. Well, on that note, Councillor, just so you're aware, when I was real estate custodian, I hired an auctioneer. Um, we, we actually got a professional auctioneer. Um, they would charge an 8% buyer's premium. My legal counsel would do all the legal work, and there was a 2% premium to him, too. So again, <clears throat> if someone bids $200,000 on the property, that's what the city gets. And they will get any prorated taxes, the pro forma yeah. taxes, for depending on when it's bought. It could be for the rest of a current fiscal year. It could be for the current fiscal year and the next fiscal year, depending on when it, the purchase happens. That 10%, the buyer pays directly to the auctioneer. So the auctioneer, so the city got its 200000 Yes. The auctioneer would get 20000 yeah. and the city would get its pro forma taxes. No, I, I, I understand all that. I'm just saying in so the aggregate, the, it, the, it, it what adds Mr. up. Mr. What, what Mr. Albanese is doing is he is the auctioneer, as well as the real estate custodian. I, I understand so, that. I, I fully understand all that. My question is, why can't it be done in-house? Uh, it was, I mean, the law office had it under units administration. Uh, when Mayor Harrington came in, he moved it out of there. Yeah. It, uh, it just and, seemed... It and just, made the real estate custodian the treasurer. It just seems to me in a city that's always fiscally constrained, we ought to look at all options and pick the one that's most favorable to us. But let me go on so that I don't monopolize too much time here. And I'm going to go on to, I think it's the second... Uh, the second handout, and it's all the way down the end of page two. Uh, the first page starts with Acton Street. But let's go to page two and let's go all the way down the end to uh, 140006. That's the parcel number. It's Crescent Street. <laughs> the interesting thing about this document is that it doesn't have the actual address on any street. You have to go to the assessor's database and look up and see where it is. So according to this, we have parcel 140006, Crescent Street, 2.9 acres, 126,324 square feet. It was taken by the city on October 14, 1988. Apparently owed on it was $18,569. And according to the assessor's database, it's valued at 544,000. Now I know someone is gonna say, when? That's not the value now. Something catastrophic probably happened to that piece of property. But at one point, the assessor's department in the city assigned that value to that parcel of land. Why wouldn't we want to get rid of that? Why wouldn't we want that to go Again, out to an RFP if I, or an auction? If I remember correctly, this one, I believe I've looked at because of the size of it. It's actually behind the Payne School. It's landlocked, behind. It's behind like that, the daycare area and the Payne School. Well, but somebody owned it as of 1988. You mean of to tell course. me they paid taxes on landlocked property for all, that, all those years? I don't know whether, you know, the daycare was there. I, I can't tell you the history of this piece of land. Uh, at one point it may have been part of something else. It, but, 
but to the extent the Payne School is still owned by the city, someone could grant a right of way and make that 2.9 acres. Of as long as it, you know, yeah. it could make it to a list, absolutely. Because I mean, it, was I just, for, it was foreclosed for taxes. Every one of these, if it was foreclosed for taxes, you can sell. Yeah. And, but and whether by the someone way, can do something with it is another story. I, well, I, again, colleagues, I'm just saying, it in a, you know, to the mayor's credit and to our credit, we, we try to do the best we can with limited financial resources. I don't know the value that might be realistically attached to any of these, but I think it might be worthwhile to go through it and to try to find out, are there parcels of land that could be sold so that we could bring in some revenue? Granted, it would be only a one-time infusion of revenue, but it might pay for something that we're not able to pay for right now. So I think, actually, I think uh, Mr. Brophy has done us a great service by raising this, and I hope we just don't file it and forget about it, because mm -hmm. it would seem to me that there is some value on this document that might mm -hmm. come back to the city if we... Uh, if we purposely go through it and, and take a look. Again, Council, all you have to do, the research just needs to be done. So yes. as a real estate custodian, he can, he, he may have looked at that already. I don't know. As long you as know. I don't have to pay him 10%, I'll be happy. Only if you're the high bidder. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could follow up on that, though, um, on a standard municipality auction, you buy it as is, where is. Mm -hmm. But you only have 30 days to close on it. So, so the council brought up a, an example, and I don't know if it's true or not, but are we giving extensions on the 30-day? Because most cities and towns don't in the Commonwealth. Um, some have been extended over the 30 days. Do you have a guess on how many that would be? Not off the top of my head. I'd have to go through every one of these sheets just to see. So the 10 percent on 2.4, he's made 240 grand on commissions since the inception of this. His portion would be 8 percent and then 2% would be the legal. Mr. Lally, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. I've gone through and, you know, highlighted stuff in, in, my, uh, in my ward. Um, sometimes, you know, in, in the past, things have happened, you know, an, an auction has happened and a sale of property has been made that residents, you know, residents in the area have no idea, no clue, nobody was told, the counselor wasn't told, um, and they're naturally, you know, upset to see, you know, what was an empty plot of land suddenly have construction on it. Um, is there, you know, is there anything about, you know, notifying residents? Uh, the auction just has to be posted. The notifications of the auction are posted two weeks in advance of the auction in two public places, usually the city hall and uh, the library. But we also put it on the website, and again, it would be on uh, Mr. Albany's web website. I, I don't know whether he advertises in the paper. I, I don't check the paper every day to see if there's an auction list in there. I'm, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to. Now, I, into my understanding would be is if someone is looking to build on that property, they would have to go to before zoning and that's where yes. the, the neighbors would be notified. That's, that's when they know about it. And right. they, to sell know, the property, I mean, I don't me. think the sale is, you know, you don't notify the neighbors of a sale. Yes. You, so that's the difference. Yes, my where I, I meant where I meant to go with that was and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna look into making this a possibility, um, notifying the you know surrounding neighbors that a property is coming up for auction, because a lot of times you know it'll be sold, someone goes to zoning or planning, and the neighbors are upset and they say you know I don't want anything there I you know if I'd known that that property was for sale I would have bought it I would have kept it just the way it was so. Um, you know, if there's nothing like that, I want to, I, I want to look into that. Um, I want to, I just want to, uh, clarify two things, you know, just so, just so I know how, how, you know, how old are these, uh, these lists, this, this, yeah, the current, I, I created this probably back in around 2003. Have it, they, it's yeah. updated monthly. Okay. I reconcile this to the ledger. So there's a number on the ledger at, of. August 31st, it would be the bottom number 
that's, what that's on that list. I forget the exact number. It's like two point two million dollars or something like that. Okay, okay. That's what we what the city would have foreclosed on it. It's not the assessed value, it's not what the you know what the property could sell for. Yeah. A lot of times. All right. And I just want to clarify this. This might be a question for Mr. Nisralla. Um, if it is if the property is used at any point in time by the city, uh, it's as, as I understand it, it is not eligible to be auctioned. Uh, the yeah, usually, I mean, if it was a city use like some of the old schools, yeah, no, you, you wouldn't. That's where you, um, if the council decides, it, ha you, know, it has you have to the option us. to make it surplus. Yes. Um, so it could either go through an RFP or, it, you know. Once it's surplus, I believe it could be considered. You could probably put it on an auction list. Yes, it uh, like the there's, there was property behind the Brookfield School, behind the baseball fields that were uh, we put out to bid for a sports complex. Mm -hmm. That property was used by the DPW at one point Correct. for pipes. So there would be no way, you know, if, if the city still owned it, there'd be no way for that to go to auction without well, city council correct. signing off. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Council Borgard, followed by Council Ianeri. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Brophy, for being here tonight. Okay, just two quick things. So people understand this, that are watching this or listening to this. We, we have, again, the name of the individual, the acreage, square foot, and then the, where we can be located, book page. And it says here, date of taking, all right? So do I understand this? This is when that they said, okay, you owe this money to the city. We're taking this. The, for some of the most recent ones, again, some of the old ones, I was using an index card. It's the date of foreclosure that the okay. city, the, the judgment was entered. Okay, thank you. And this is not to give you a hard time. This is for people to realize. I mean, I'm looking at one here, 6 6 1932, 8 20 1935. This is, the, it's been on the city's books for this long. Yes. Okay. All right, because it's just uh, pretty far out here. Again, you'd almost have to go to a map, see where it is, okay. what it is. Oh, no, no, I realize, I mean, and this is, again. There's, there's some on this list that are right near um, the Thatcher Street landfill. Okay. I've been on this list for, you know, could be many years. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm familiar with these streets, and, uh, you know, it was, I was glancing at it, and I said, I want to make sure I understand this. And at the end is the balance. Okay, and I guess this means that at, at, at some point that there was never any, it, it never, how would I say it, further accumulated because it was just owned by the city, that was it? Correct. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Yaneri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Brophy, for, for being here this evening. And uh, um, we've all, it seems we've had uh, quite a discussion but the person that should be here isn't here, to be truthful with you. So, I mean, I don't like to put it on you, but that's, you know, sometimes I'll follow. So I hope we do, you know, continue it to the next meeting because there's, there's going to be questions that, that he's got to answer as well. Um, but just want to follow up on uh, what a couple of my colleagues have said, and, and, I, uh, and I totally agree somewhat with uh, even what Council Fowler has mentioned of, uh, you know, doing it somewhat in-house instead of it being done the way that it is being done, done now. Um, I, I think what's really, uh, you know, an interesting factor to I and, and the public doesn't realize is just how much money the, um, uh, the custodial person makes. And, you know, I, I think at this point, you know, people are very concerned to, to know that. And uh, even more people are beginning to ask, uh, you know, the question of, uh, you know, is that person even in a conflict for doing what he's doing and being a developer and working on projects and, I'll refer that you to know, him. Well, if the legal counsel wants to answer it, I don't know if he'll give me, you know, the answer I'm looking for, but, you know, maybe, maybe he wants to. But still, in any case, um, you know, if I'm reading it right and understand it, you indicate that he gets about 8% of, of the total. So if we did, like you say, from the point forth of 2014 to, uh, what, 2017, that gives us, what, $2.4 million that came in. So he's taken about $192,000 himself. So... Um, it's a great paycheck. It is a real great paycheck. 
and I'm sure you'd like to just see a piece of it if it was being done in the treasurer's office, to be truthful with you, but still. It was at one point, and yeah, I, it, I, I certainly didn't make that money. Right, so. and, and, and where it rightfully belonged, to be truthful with you, because all past administrations had it in the treasurer's office, as far as I know, Harrington I, administration, Belzardi administration. I, you, council uh, units had uh, um, Attorney Plouffe was the real estate custodian right, for his but, 10 years. But he was still, he, he was still here, here in the building as well, though, that's what I'm saying, so. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, it just boggles my mind a little bit to know that that's the type of money that we're paying out. Um, and it, it, it's just, it just it, to me, it's just a little bit ludicrous, but um, maybe that's something that we'll have to look at as a city council and how we can change that or, or make a change even to the ordinance and how that all works in the future. But, um, and, and if, if, Mr. if Attorney Nezzarello wants to answer my question that I had asked, uh, you know, is he any type of a conflict with, with being, the, being the custodian and, being a developer and, you know. Well, council, with all due respect, I think that question is in the form of a, seeking an opinion. I'd rather defer. And if you're gonna ask for an opinion, I'll give you an opinion, but at this time, I don't think I'd be prepared to respond to it. Okay, no, that's fine, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for our own opinion through our own legal counsel as well. So we, we'll converse on that at some other okay. time too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions, any follow-ups? Council. Follow-ups, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brophy, you said that the custodian gets 8% and then the other 2% goes for legal? Yes. He's the lawyer. There's legal notifications. The Attorney Coppola's office, who is my legal counsel, and forecloses on these properties. Okay. Um, he does the legal portion of posting all the notices, sending out notices. Um, he has the full list that would needs to be notified from land court. Uh, a lot of these properties they actually foreclosed on. Um, so we're ensuring that we're doing everything under the law that we need to do. And those legal notifications are posted again in two, two buildings. So he's a lawyer and you still need to use a legal team to do this stuff. Why couldn't you do it and, and save us the 8%? Why couldn't I do it? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that would have to be done in the Attorney Nasrallah's office. But it, it first, again, they would almost have to contact a, the Attorney Coppola's office to get all the parties that need to be notified. Because again, land courts, we foreclose, the judgment is on one name. But there could be a list of names that would have an interest in the property. Could be heirs, could be, you know, um, any, family member could have an interest in this property. So land court make, ensures that every person that has an interest in every entity that has an interest in these properties is notified of the proceedings that the city plans to foreclose, that the city ha you know, has filed a case, when the case is. So all those legal notifications are sitting in my attorney's office. So it makes more sense to have the person who's done the work do this doesn't cost me anything because the buyers pay the extra 2% to pay that. But um, I remember this back in 2014 and we were told that a, a percentage of the sales of these properties, let's say the city, let's, let's use the $200,000 that Council Firewell brought up. The city gets $200,000 and the uh, custodian gets the 8%, uh, the lawyer, the legals, the 2%, and there was supposed to be a percentage coming back to the city for... Originally, it was supposed to be the 2% that go to the attorneys was to come to the city for us to pay for the attorney. No, no, However, but there was, there, there was my understanding that there was a, some, some sort of a percentage that was supposed to come back to the city in the correct. form of a, a grant for future... No, that, that was the 2%. What, what, at the time, the city couldn't accept that money back to be used specifically for the legal purposes. So when Ben proposed that, I basically explained to him, Ben, I can't take the 2% just to use for that. I can't, I don't have a fund I can put that money in and pay the attorney specifically for that. I would have to pay out of my budget and that money wouldn't go into my budget. Let me ask you something, if you know this. Um, in other municipalities that actually go through the same process that we're going through, are, is the city paying the legal above and beyond what the, what's paid to the custodian? Not that I know of. I mean, again, I can't 
answer what other communities have done for auctions. Um, I know having done it myself, held auctions, the way we had them when it was in the treasurer's office was the city got it, the money, the, hot, the bid money, the auctioneer would get a premium and the legal counsel would get a premium. So there was no out-of-pocket cost to the city. The auctioneer would then go promote it, the attorney would do his legal work, and the city got the proceeds of the sale. Yeah, the issue I have with this is because I remember distinctively when we were talking about this that there was a percentage that was Correct. supposed to at come the time, to the city. At the time, it was supposed to be 2% given back to that the city. That he was city. donating back to the city. That's what it made it sound like. He was donating be, like a, a percentage it, it back was, to the city for us to use for something else. But now it, it seems it that that's to going used, to the legal. It was thing. to be used to just for legal purposes yeah. to foreclose on more properties or to do. But it's not being used for that. We, don't, we couldn't accept it. I couldn't accept the two percent back. I know, but we accept, specifically, we accept donations on a regular basis: five hundred dollars here, two hundred dollars there, for all kinds would, of stuff. But I couldn't accept it for the purpose that it was intended to. There was no groundwork to set to take that in and put it right into my budget to be used for legal. Yeah, but uh, Mr. Brophy, what that I'm saying—that was the purpose of it. I know, but well, what I'm saying is that when when we were sold this bill of goods back in the days, it came out Correct. as I I will be donating a percentage to the city, which we said great. You know, that's you know I'm going to collect whatever the property brings in, um, my, plus my legal fees, my percentage fees, and then I'm going to make a personal donation to the city. You know, and we're looking at. $2 million, we're talking about $40,000 in the 2% that we could use for something else. But all of a sudden now we're hearing that that 2% couldn't Again, be used counsel, for this. I don't have the, the documentation of what Ben proposed at the time, but I know the way he worded it, it was strictly for legal fees, to be used for legal fees. The way he explained it to me was to keep the pipeline going so that I would have more money above and beyond my budget to get more properties into Land Corp and pay Attorney Coppola's office. But there was no grounds through DOR to actually do that, to accept that money that way. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I... And I, so it, instead it turned into, Ben, instead of doing the 2% to the city, give the 2% directly to Attorney Coppola's office to do the work. Jesus. Well, I, uh, is how we had done it in the past, basically. The buyer's premium never came to the city. We got all the proceeds from the sale. And yeah. the city paid nothing. Yeah. And I, uh, just to, uh, to refer to my colleague here from Ward 1, uh, and I did mention to him that I remember the first time that the custodian came in, uh, the reason why I was so bothered by this is that we actually auction a property, a single family home, with people living in it. Correct. I remember that, and that's the issue that I was having is how do we notify people that these things are taking place so that people who are maybe living in these situations well, don't get you know, somebody knocking on the door. The notifications are mailed to the owners. That's what Attorney Coppola's office does. They will send certified letters to all interested parties in the property. To the owners, but not necessarily to the resident, because the, the owner might be in New York somewhere, and the, and the tenant might be a... I wouldn't know that. I mean, nobody on the city would really know that situation. Comes. Well, let's, I mean, but, but see, this is what I was saying. If, if the, we if get a notified. Person there, you basically notify at the auction that the property is tenanted. Yeah, this is what I, I'm going to come back to what I started with. If we get notified, then we ourselves can kind of help this situation out so we don't run into the issues that we ran into in the beginning. And that's why I was saying that we need to be notified once these properties become on gets to a list somewhere and that list needs to be sent to us so we have an idea what's what's being done do you see the list before the auction starts again i i'm given the list what i do is i'm given the list i send that to C attorney coppola's office to start preparing the legal documentation and make sure that it's actually a foreclosed property that it can be on the list so let me let me ask you a question just as a backup could you make that list available to us once yeah. you receive it yeah since he decides to do whatever, I mean, he does whatever he wants to do, so uh, we don't have any say in whether or not he can do this or can't do that. Can Absolutely, you make that available to yes. us? 
Absolutely. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other follow-ups? Chairman Hassel, Mr. Connor, I just have a quick question through you, sir. Mr. Connor, what will your thoughts be about setting up an enterprise account strictly dedicated to this? I have to research whether it was one, you know, there, there are restrictions by the state as to what kinds of activities can be under an enterprise fund. Uh, perhaps a revolving account as opposed yeah, to I would an enterprise think, I would account. think because I recall Attorney Albanese not limiting it to legal fees. He said out of the generosity of his heart, he was going to give back the percentage to the city of Brockton. So I think if we could respectfully ask you to look into that, because that I, I might will, make sense I will, to set that I will, up. I will look into it. If the, the problem that uh, Mr. Brophy is describing is for us to have it in his budget, we'd have to estimate it and front it out of the general fund, and that's an estimated receipt. And I don't think we want to do that. A revolving fund might be the more appropriate way if the state would allow it, and I'm not sure that they, they will. We can check on that, though. Okay. Thank you. At the Daniel Motion Councils, I know we talked about postponement. We talked about it, right? Postponement. Um, oh, to postpone, yeah, um, for Mr. Albanese to come. Uh, the next, fin this is, what is this, September? Guys, oh. remember, next month we're back in full session, every Monday night. So you want to give him second in October? Give him time. Second fin come in October? Yes. There's a motion on the floor is properly seconded to postpone this matter to the second finance in October. All in favor? I'll oppose that motion carries. We're going to postpone it to the second fin come in October. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councils. We're going to go on to the next agenda item, Madam Clerk. Resolve. To invite the city solicitor, police chief, and traffic commission chair to appear before the finance committee to discuss the current process and procedures relative to block parties and or neighborhood parties within the city of Brockton. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John Crowley, Chief Brockton Police Department. Councilors, as you recall, um, we, we did hear, we had Attorney Nazarella here, and we also had the traffic commissioner here last month. Um, we did continue this, this matter. This is a resolve that I followed, Councilor Fowell and Councilor Ian Airy. Um, the police chief came up to me tonight. We had a good conversation. Uh, he indicated to me that he did indeed give a letter um, dated August 1st uh, to inform that he wasn't going to attend the August 21st meeting due to a vacation. I'd never received that letter, Councilor, so uh, I, 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 you know, I take his word for it. But going forward, the police chief and I have an open conversation where He'll formally uh, put a letter in, he will email me, and he'll give me a call on my cell phone as well. So there won't be any lost disconnect on communication. Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, Councilors. Good evening. Yeah? Good evening. Are we going to do questions first? Would you like me to just give a little bit of information for openers? Sure. Okay. So the resolve asks for information uh, regarding the current process and procedures relative to block parties and or neighborhood parties within the city. And I think most counselors uh, may be aware that a few weeks ago, um, sponsored by Chief Stadensky, we have filed with the council uh, a pretty detailed ordinance change uh, for the council's consideration that would significantly change the manner in which block parties uh, are permitted. Currently, there's virtually no official ordinance or regulation. What there is is an existing procedure or process. There's an existing process in place that was in place before I became mayor, and I've just continued to use it. I'll be happy to take a couple minutes to review with you what that process is. I'll also be happy to highlight for you what in the major points of what we're recommending to the council, but we filed that ordinance change with the council, certainly with the intent of working with the council, assuming that the council would send that to the ordinance subcommittee and there'd be an opportunity for us to work with the council on any additional tweaks, adjustments, amendments that the council uh, might suggest to improve the legislation, but at the end we would end up with something that is far better than what we have right now. Uh, in terms of what we do right now, there is, first of all, there's nothing specifically that says the word block party or neighborhood party. Uh, there's a process around a special event permit and there's a special event questionnaire. So when someone uh, is looking for a permit for a special event, they get an application from the mayor's office that contains several pages, but it's basically about a two-page application 
that asked for quite a bit of detailed information about the special event. Once that application is received back, it is sent out to both the police chief and the fire chief with an additional form that the police chief or fire chief or their designee uh, completes and makes a recommendation back as to whether they recommend that the permit be issued, and if so, are they asking for any particular specific restrictions or conditions specific to that particular event. Uh, I can't tell you the exact number of years, but that process was in place for years before I came in. We have continued it. I think that now there's an opportunity to put something in place that's far better than just a process. But I would emphasize that before any permit is issued, all of the information provided by the applicant goes to both the police chief and the fire chief or their designees. In the case of police, the traffic commissioner actually handles it uh, designated by the chief. On the fire department, fire chief is gone. I, I think he has a couple different high-ranking uh, deputy chiefs or captains that he may assign it to for a review. Uh, those recommendations come back. And essentially, when it comes to issuing the permit, I rely on the advice of our public safety officials. If police and fire both say they don't have any objection to it, we issue it. If they do have an objection, we don't issue it. Uh, if they ask for a specific um, condition, then that condition becomes part of it. A standard condition, and when you talk about block parties, you know, I guess what we're really talking about is the blocking of traffic on a city street for a period of time. Uh, there is always a clear stipulation that the road must remain open to emergency vehicles. So in whatever manner that they block the street, it has to be able to be unblocked within seconds to allow uh, an emergency vehicle to go through. And that is a standard requirement uh, that is always explained to each person that comes in. Um, we've done, prior to this year, my first three years, we did about 20 of them a year. This year we've done 12 uh, in the wake of uh, a party that was presented to us to be a block party on Myrtle Street in early July uh, that caused a lot of problems for the neighborhood, a lot of negative impact on the neighbors. And as a result of our meeting with the Quality of Life Task Force, meeting with the residents of the neighborhood, meeting with our public safety officials, we came to the conclusion that we needed a much more formalized process with more detailed requirements, and that's why we've submitted the ordinance change to the council. Uh, quickly, just the, the high points without getting too buried into the details, is that first of all, we would define what a special event is. There's language to do that, because one of the problems with the process is what exactly is a special event. We don't have a formal definition. We know what it's been used for in the past. Uh, it would shift the issuing and oversight of these licenses from the mayor's office to the license commission. I don't know why it's in the mayor's office. It was in the mayor's office when I got there. Uh, but as we look at this thing in debrief, I think it's far more su a far more suitable role for the license commission than it is for the mayor's office. Uh, it stipulates what would have to be provided in terms of uh, the application. It would require the license commission. Uh, the application could not even be considered by the license commission without the recommendations from both the police chief and the fire chief. It would call for the license commission to establish its own written policies and guidelines regarding the issuing of these special event permits. Um, couple of real points that are covered in the, in, in the proposed ordinance also. The street closure, if it was allowed, would be handled by the city. The DPW under the supervision of the police department would handle the street closure. One of the ongoing, I think, issues we've had is that although there's a requirement that you don't obstruct emergency vehicles, there's nothing spelled out specifically to say what you can and can't do and whether or not you're in compliance or not. So we think it's important that there be a, if a street closure were allowed with the license commission, that the DPW under the supervision of the police would do the closing and 
opening of the street. Uh, it would also call, very similar to, say, a one-day alcohol license with the License Commission, it would require a public hearing at a License Commission meeting with notification to abutters, similar to other processes with the city. The troubled event of early July was presented on the application as a block party, neighborhood block party. When someone says the word block party to me, what that means to me is a bunch of the neighbors in the neighborhood all getting together for a cookout and they want to use the street as kind of a common gathering area for a couple of hours. I've been to a lot of them. They're great events. That's not what this event turned out to be. This event on Myrtle Street, the neighbors didn't know about it, weren't invited. Um, it was one of the real underlying problems. So I think that a public hearing at a regularly scheduled license commission meeting where the neighbors are notified in advance that there's going to be a hearing on one of these special event permits would give neighbors the opportunity to have input with the license commission before any decision was made, both pro and con. Neighbors could show up and say, this is a great event we do every year. There's about 40 of us. We have a cookout. This is what we do. Great. Or neighbors could show up and say, you got to be kidding me. That house is nothing but problems. The neighbors aren't invited. You know, it, it would give the neighborhood input. And then finally, I think that um, the key provision that we're recommending in the proposed or amended ordinance to you is that both the fire chief and the police chief would have the right to revoke the permit at any time, including during the event. If either there's been a misrepresentation, there's some violation of law, or some very broad language that in the interest of public safety, either the police chief or his designee, fire chief or his designee, believes that there's a public safety risk, they would have the right to revoke the permit at any time. I think it's a safeguard that we don't have right now. Um, I think it gives the public safety people a great deal of leverage if they are dealing with a situation to say, either you do this or we're going to call it a day and clear the area and revoke your permit. I, I think it would be a very important tool for police and fire to have that they don't have right now. There are a lot of other recommendations that we'll share with you at the Ordinance Committee. But these other recommendations, we would suggest that the License Commission be granted some discretion to establish their own policies and procedures that they could tweak as they go along without having to come back for an ordinance change every time they decide there's a little bit better way to do it. So I've tried to give you an overview of how we do them right now, how we suggest we would do them, and I would just reiterate that uh, we are looking forward to working with the council through the ordinance process to develop a final ordinance that we all think would um, meet the needs of the residents and allowing certain types of special events, but with the safeguards in place to make sure that we're protecting the rights and interests of the neighbors. And with that, I'll take questions. Council Fowle, followed by Council Bonds. Uh, just a couple of questions. I mean, we've been over this in some detail, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard what you said about the ordinance, but you issued a license under Chapter 136 of the Massachusetts General Laws, and I do not believe that if this body passes an ordinance, that's going to supersede the provisions of Mass General Laws, Chapter 136, Section 5, which squarely places on the mayor of a city the right to issue a public entertainment on Sunday license, which you did, for a graduation block party. So, uh, and I'm not asking you to respond to that. I'm sure your, the solicitor will tell you the same thing, that I don't believe you can just discard a state law by use of an ordinance. But. Uh, but I, it will, I will rely on the solicitor for guidance, um, but I think I could just go out of the business of issuing the permits. I mean, this is a process, counselor, that was in place for years before I got there. I've simply continued the existing process that was in place in light of the, um, in light of the incidents that took place on Myrtle Street in early July. I think it became apparent to all of us that it's not a perfect process and that we need to take some proactive steps 
to protect the rights and interests of neighbors, and I'm willing to work with you to do yep. that. No, I, I, I appreciate that, but, but you did sign this permit, and this, this particular permit is interesting because these are issued when the person, the issuing authority, is granting authority for something to be held on a Sunday, quote, for which a charge in the form of payment or collection of money or other valuable consideration is made for the privilege of being present thereat or engaging therein. And then it goes on to say, except horse racing, dog racing. So when you issued this to the person, you knew or clearly should have known that they were going to charge to be at this event. That's why they no, came in no, to get- No, absolutely not. I did not know they were going to charge. It was not indicated on there they were going to charge. On their application, there was no indication that they were going to charge. And the word block party, to me, means neighborhood, neighbors. You invite the neighbors from the block over. Clearly, in my mind, in this one particular incident, and we've issued about 70 of these since I've been the mayor, this is the only one that we've ever had an issue with. So clearly in this case, the people applying for the permit misled us in terms of what the exact nature of the event was. This is part of a larger issue, and what, what you're just, I think the direction you're going with this, Counselor, is I think a separate and distinct, much larger issue we have with house parties in general during the warm weather months across the city. Well, I, I, it, with all due respect, I just want to focus on this one issue that's before us tonight because this, this document is very plain as to what it is. It was a graduation block party, and it is issued when someone wants to hold an event on Sunday for which there is a charge to get in. And in fact, the neighbors have reported to us, Councilor right. Ian Erie and Monaghan and I met with them, that alcohol was being served, right. And I know the, the, the street was blocked. And by the way, in this license that you signed, uh, it, it squarely says that it can be revoked at any time by the mayor. So when the police went down to Myrtle Street and they found the street blocked, <clears throat> to me that should have raised a red flag. Wait a minute, we've got something going on here that really we weren't thinking was going to take place. I would have gone back and I would have checked periodically. I would have walked around observed whether people were drinking, observed what was You're going on. You're suggesting that I should have been down in the neighborhood police. walking around checking? No, the, oh, police. the police. Okay. The police should yeah. have gone back and checked periodically. Because just, just to be clear, Counselor, I was not made aware of any issues regarding this event until after midnight that the, night. And, and yeah. you know what? I, I grant you that. But I guess the follow-up question of that is, do you have an explanation why once the police went down there and found the entire street blocked and someone gave them a hard time that they wouldn't have gone back and periodically checked? I mean, does that sound like an unreasonable expectation for the police? I, I'm going to let the chief answer for the police. However, based upon the review that I was given afterwards, there were several visits by the police, not just one. Okay. Who decided to waive the fee for a Sunday entertainment license? We, we don't charge the fee for any of them. We just, that, that's kind of a generic blank license that was being used in the office permit form that's been used for these all along. Well, the, we, don't, the, the, we, uh, we don't charge anybody the fee. Well, the, the, uh, my understanding is we have charged people fees for events down at uh, uh, Keith Park in past years. and in That's fact, a different it, type of event, Counselor. Well, the ordinances call for a $120 fee for a Sunday entertainment license. And this is a public entertainment on Sunday license. Right. It's, and it's, someone it's, specifically... And what I'm telling you, Counselor, is no. that it's an existing process where that particular permit form has been used for all special events that were permitted under the same process, the same way it's been done for years. I can't quote to you, I guess you've got more time than I do to study the... Well, how, Details how would, of Mass General Laws, I rely upon the, the solicitor's office. The bottom line is on this event, Counselor, I rely on all of these and all 70, hang on one second, I'll give you the number, 73. In all 73 instances in my three and a half years as mayor where I've signed one of these permits, I rely solely upon the guidance of the police and fire departments. I trust the public safety people to look at the event and advise me whether I should issue the permit, not issue the permit, or issue it with some type of restriction. 
That's the process we followed on every single one. And I will tell you that because of the problems with that particular issue, we've said there's got to be a much better way to do this. I'm not happy with the existing process we inherited. I've stopped issuing them except for a couple where they were ongoing annual events that had a successful track record of not having any prior incidents. I have not entertained any more new ones since that event. All right. in, in, in anticipation of working with the council to put a much better process in place through ordinance. Who on the police department gave final approval to you saying this is good to go, sign it? I don't have the full form in front of me. Well, it's it's, not, I, think, it's, I think you have it, right? You have no, I, there are no police signatures on here whatsoever. That's nope. why I wondered who... who At one point, we provided copies of all of that, Councillor. So you... you I'll be happy to... to uh, we've provided copies of all that previously. So, so we'll be happy to provide it again. I, I was just Chief, wondering Do you remember who you, signed that one? Captain, Captain DeBarry, DeBarry, the traffic did. commissioner. Okay. And now that's, did, Chief, that is typically your designee, correct? Right. And, and Captain do, DeBarry is the traffic commissioner designated by the chief. And, and do we ask him if he's gone down to look at the venue to make sure we know what the people are going to be doing? I you trust know? the police and fire officials to do their job, give me good guidance, and I rely upon the guidance of the police chief and the fire chief. I'm not a public safety official with decades of experience like them. I trust them to guide us. I, I, I think I, in that, with partic all, with all due in that particular event, Councillor, it was misrepresented what the nature of the event was going to be. We, we, we know that now, but with all due respect, I simply asked, did you ask the captain if he went down and met with the, with the neighbors to find out what will be no. the extent of the block? No, the party? answer is no. All right. Uh, I, I just... The captain was provided a two-page questionnaire with all of the relative information to the event, including the contact in info of the people hosting the event. Um, I trust the police and the fire to look at each event, give good advice, but I do believe, and we, I'm not sure exactly where we're going with this, but I think you're making the same argument that I would make that the license commission is a better place to do this than the mayor's office. I, I, I haven't gotten to that point yet because okay. I still think we need to get by chapter 136. I, I don't think you can simply say, I'm not going to sign these, I'm going to send it over to the license commission. I don't think an ordinance can supersede that okay. statute. Well then, well, I guess we'll have to rely on the solicitor for some guidance I, with I that. I'm not will. an attorney. Yeah. But I'll tell you that we, in all 73 permits that we've issued since I've been mayor, 72 of which there were no questions or problems. It's been the exact same process. And no one has ever been signed without both police and fire signing off first. I trust police and fire to give good guidance as to whether we should issue the permit or not. And, and I concur with you. I, I do think, however, if we, if we know there's going to be a fairly large gathering, that it behooves us to ask some background questions about anticipated size of the crowd, where they'll be located, whether they're sold or not, will there be alcoholic beverages there, and, and that's what I hope will The problems like, well, with that particular event went far beyond the idea of a special event permit for a block party. The special event permit expired at 9 o'clock. The problems got worse later in the night when it was no longer even a special event block party. It was a house party with a lot of problems and issues. I've spent quite a bit of time with the same neighbors that you have. I've heard the complaints. Our quality of life task force is responding to similar complaints from other neighborhoods of houses that are having repeat parties, and we've cracked down and closed down several of them. We're very concerned about the rights of people to enjoy their property. You, you, you know, as both a police officer and a former mayor, this is America. Up to a point, you have a right to do what you want to do on your property. But there is a threshold, and there's a threshold that by where if you cross that threshold, you are now interfering with your neighbor's rights to enjoy their property. And, and that's where the issue comes in. I can have a cookout in my backyard with 20 people, and my neighbors think it's great and there's no problem whatsoever. But I could also have 100 people over be doing all kinds of things wrong, loud music, drinking, et cetera, et cetera. And now I've crossed that threshold, 
and I am interfering with my neighbor's right, I'm creating a disturbance, I'm interfering with my neighbor's right to enjoy their property, and then they've crossed the line, and that's when the city does have to be positioned to come in, respond effectively, and protect the rights of the neighbors, and we're doing that on a daily basis. Well, my last comment is that for whatever reason, one of the licenses which you sign specifically calls for having a detail officer there, and I still don't understand why. When the police went down there and they found what they observed, street blocked off and apparently in anticipation of a loud party, no police detail, why they didn't take action and say, you know what, folks, you got to go into your backyard. I don't Maybe. believe there was a requirement of a police detail, and I think the, in, the application indicated that they were going to provide private security. I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage, Counselor, because the resolve asked me to come in and talk about the process. Had I known you were going to ask specific questions about a specific event, I would have asked for a copy of the file to I'm answer only questions. I'm only asking about something that you signed, sir, and it says under item three, the applicant will provide a police detail during hours of operation. That's all I'm asking. I'm not trying to trap this you. This particular event? This particular event. That's what you again? signed. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. It's number three. Okay, the confusion is that's in some standard language and they're not in a condition that was added, right? Yeah, right, it's, it's plainly marked in there. And, and I'm sure the council will work with you and the solicitor because we don't want to repeat, but uh, the neighbors still I think, are. I think that all of these questions, Councilor, there's no one more unhappy in this city than me with the events that took place on Myrtle Street on that night in early July. Believe me when I tell you, I've spent a lot of time down there since. We've put a big focus. We put a tremendous amount of work into bringing that proposed ordinance change to you because we want to work with the council to put a better system in place. Uh, we clearly find the current system lacking, uh, as pointed out by this particular event. But one out of 73 we've had problems with. It pointed out some deficiencies and flaws in a process that we inherited that now based upon what we've all learned from the events on Myrtle Street, there are flaws in the current process. We need to do better. And I'm just as committed to doing better as you are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Bonds, followed by Council Cruz, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I have just a few questions. So uh, one of them you actually answered about the violation and that uh, a police officer or any public safety representative has the authority to revoke the license at any time. So that was one of my questions. Um, but I did have a question. I, I so think it's, it's police chief for his designee, fire chief for his designee, but we're certainly willing to work with the council on the language. Right, sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not really worried about the language on that, just the, the assertion that that will happen if you violate your, the terms of your uh, I think it would special give, permit. I think it would give them some additional leverage. Okay. Um, so in that same vein, let's just say that I, um, I'm a habitual, you know, line crosser and I, you know, continue to have violations. Um, I misrepresent several times and I'm just, you know, just hell bent on having the kind of parties I want to have. Forget the rules. So is there anything in uh, the proposed ordinance that will restrict folks from being able to or to suspend or revoke so I, their I, I think you're talking about. I, I, I think you're talking about two different types of events. You know, we do a dozen to 20 or so of these special events applications each year. During the warm weather months, particularly on the weekends, mm -hmm. we have hundreds of house parties going on around the city. They're not permitted, they're not reviewed. Right. Police respond to neighbors' complaints. Police do have a protocol that they use in these uh, noise disturbance complaints. Every situation is a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but we are, if someone after two warnings and we have to come back a third time to the same address on the same night, we are citing people with a, a court summons process, the police department, 
to uh, charge the owner of the property with a disturbance. That's not what I asked. Okay. Though. Okay. So, so you're asking specifically about a street block party? I'm talking about when I come in for a permit, I mess up the first time. I wait a little while. I come back. You know, I'm I'm fully you know repentant. I'll right. I'll follow the rules. I come back. Police have to come six seven times. Whatever. Yeah. Back to my house the second if. time. So I I violated again. How many times does a person get to uh, and like you said, this, these people misrepresented right. what the the purpose of the party? So I guess was, I can only. Oh, if you could just let me finish. Okay. Well, I'm trying to give we you. We won't the have answer. any confusion. So if but if you let me finish the question, then we won't have any confusion. Is there a policy, or will there be something stated that says Shana Barnes, that lives at 123 Main Street, can no longer come in and get an application? If I continue to, to mess up and violate, can you restrict my ability to apply for a special um, event license or block, right. block party? The proposed ordinance calls for the license commission to establish its own set of rules and guidelines. So I would assume that they would build that in when we have much more time at an ordinance subcommittee meeting. When you consider this ordinance, our quality of life task force has actually prepared suggested, recommended process and procedures for the license commission to consider as they establish their guidelines on these licenses. Okay, I just we, want to make sure that's included. That's that's all. Absolutely. Because if somebody's a habitual offender, but they can just keep getting licenses. Even under the current process, Council, this is the first one, first time, one out of 73, that we've had a problem. And I can assure you that as long as I'm mayor, if these applicants ever come back, I'm never giving them a permit to do anything at any time, anywhere. Oh, good. So it should be in there. One time you mess up, you're out. We're going to leave that. I believe you'll have the ordinance to work on. I believe that the license commission, one of the reasons to me why the license commission makes sense is because they have the ability to promulgate their own rules and regulations, just like the Board of Health. So I think that we can give them a set of clear recommendations and guidelines. I think you put the big stuff in the ordinance, but then in the detail, you, you, you allow that body to form their own uh, policies and procedures relative to issuing these permits because then they have the ability to tweak it as they go along. We don't have to change the ordinance every time they decide that there's a little bit better way to do it. Okay. But all of that is open to discussion with the council when you consider the ordinance. I, I don't think our proposed ordinance is a finished document at all. I think it's, uh, it's what we think we've put together as some pretty good suggestions, right. but to work with the council and come up with the best possible ordinance we can. Okay. Well, just remember, I, I suggested that when it comes up. Um, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll call it the Barnes Amendment. Oh, no, no, no. That's okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure it's in. So now about this um, alcohol license. So now, um, so when I've been involved with um, like the holiday party, the winners end ball and all these things, we've gone before license and um, gotten alcohol license or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was my limited understanding of how that works. So that was our permission from the city to sell beer and wine. It was a one day liquor permit issued by the license commission. Right. So the other entities in the city that have done that, the Shaw Center or some other places, you know, casino night or whatever. So. Is, would that also be Two separate kind of things. something that they can, but, but, but you mentioned something though about um, like these people will have to get a one day liquor license. Will that also no, give I, them I the was, approval? I was, oh, if you just let me finish. Well, your, your question's faulty. Let me finish. You don't I, you're know saying I said something I didn't say, counsel. Off. You said that they would have to get, a, you'd have, they'd have to go before the liquor, um, no, to get I, a liquor license. I did not say that, counselor. What I said is I compared what we were proposing as this procedure with the license commission would be similar to the current process that the license commission uses now when they issue one day liquor licenses. I was just giving you an analogy of how I visualize the ordinance would work with the license commission as the issuing and oversight authority. I was giving an example of a similar duty that the license commission does right now which I think speaks to the fact that the license commission would be the right place to oversee these. Okay. So with that said, let me tweak my question. So I come before you, Shannon Barnes 123 Main Street comes before you and I want to have alcohol at my party. That's not what's in front of us, Council. That's a wholly separate different issue. That's a license commission 
existing process that has nothing to do with the permit that's in front of us tonight. Okay, I'm not asking about the permit. I'm just asking about just general going forward, having parties in the city. Like, what will be allowed, what won't be allowed? That's all I'm asking I don't know how I can answer any better, Council. You're asking a question about a one-day liquor license that has nothing to do with what For this a party. matter is. You would have to get a second license. Right. But whatever the, I, what, whatever the current what procedures asking, are with the License Commission now to obtain a one-day license to serve alcohol. Okay. I was just asking about the sale of alcohol. Right. That's, that's, does that my give general them the my general to sell alcohol? Because right. these my, people were allegedly selling food right. and alcohol. There's no question that private citizens should not be selling alcohol. That was a violation, if in fact it did occur. Okay. I'm all set. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Council. Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, actually, that's where I'm going. So let's, t you know, I don't know if you heard, uh, the last meeting I spoke, these people just, this was no block party. It never Correct. was. It never, uh, uh, we're making a big, and I'm fine with that, and I'll announce Monday night when the October ordinance meeting will be, but we're, we're getting into a big design of block parties when that's not really what happened. My question first, uh, I think, is going to be for Mr. Nazarella and then for the chief. We're told, and it seems to be no secret, that they were selling alcohol. Right. And Councilor Barnes's question that she was starting to ask is where I'm going. First of all, Attorney Nazarella, no private home can apply for a no. one-day liquor license, correct? Could you? Correct. Can you step up? Because I have a couple of questions about, because what really happened that night was not a block party gone awry. It was a violation of the liquor laws, correct? If those people were selling liquor, charging to come to a party, however, and we're hearing more and more about it in the city, they have violated state law, correct? Yes. And there's no, there are, there are no conditions where they could come in and have a party at a private home and apply for a one-day liquor license. Am I correct? Correct. So my question then goes to the chief, and I don't know if he can answer this, and I know there's an ongoing investigation into a murder that night so that took place there or thereabouts. Has the homeowner, first of all, I feel stay up, I'm sorry, Attorney Nezrell, well, stay there for a minute. What is the penalty for running an illegal bar room? What is the statutory penalty? What's, the, what's the penalty? Yeah, if, I'd have to look at the statute to be clear on that. I mean, basically, I is want, it the I first? I want to guess. Is it a, There's a penalty. I, I don't. I mean, is it a do, I assume it's probably just a dollar fine to start with, or something like that. Well, Would I be fine? Probably. But there is a penalty. Yes. If I turn my house into a bar room, into a business for that night, I have broken state law. Correct. Yes. And city ordinance. Correct. My question now, Chief, is has that homeowner been cited for anything? To my knowledge, it, was, um, it wasn't until the incident happened later in the night when officers went to that address and actually viewed the property. Um, they saw what looked like a bar was set up, and they saw red solo cups, all of them empty. Um, they presumed perhaps that was happening. But we have no proof that it actually was. Well, did, I, did you have our license agents investigate that? I mean, clearly this person, and I want to be careful how I say this, but this person facilitated, in my opinion, a shooting. It was the facilitator of a, what became a, I don't even recall, did the person die that night? Uh, yes, sir. It's a murder. My question is, did the licensed agents then get called in to investigate? I mean, if there, if there was liquor being sold. The, the officers that responded on scene that night, if they saw evidence of that, they could have taken out a complaint. But my I'm question is. They didn't find that. They, they did, so that homeowner has not been fined or, or there's been no, no, uh, no criminal action. No, no criminal or it might even be civil. I mean, you know, my guess is it's a, not a criminal uh, complaint the first one I don't know I'm not a lawyer but but any homeowner who's doing that is breaking the law and should be and can be at least fined I don't know well I'm gonna ask you turning as to get get us the information on what what constitutes I can, I can get you the information on what constitutes a violation what the penalty is 
I think what the chief is stating, there wasn't any evidence in front of the police that evening that would warrant some type of legal action. And I also would probably give pause to making any connection between what took place that evening and the murder as you did. And I think uh, Captain DuBarry was clear about that the last time he was here. So I, I just think we ought to be guarded on that type of relationship. And I, and I should be more careful on that. But I'm very angry about this. And it's probably we become one of the biggest problems in this city is people, people running parties at their private residences that are not private parties. They're not. They're, and this is a kind of what Councilor Barnes is talking about. You know, again, I get angry because a block party is a group of neighbors getting together. This was not. This was somebody allegedly and that's what I'm asking, allegedly running a bar room at their house. Turns out with the unwitting help of the city by closing off the street, and we didn't mean to do that, we assumed it's a, a, a good group of people getting together for a good reason. But this person broke the law. And I think as part of the investigation into what happened that night, should have been, and I mean, I can't imagine that we couldn't find somebody to say, yeah, I paid for a beer. Fine, you just broke the law, here's it. And I, it might even be a hundred dollar fine to start with. I don't even know. But we need to start send, getting out. Send a message. We need to start sending a message to these people that are running these parties that it is illegal and we are not going to put up with it. And the person that ran that, again, and I take that back if I intimated that they were part of the murder, but the, the problem was what was happening at the house is where everything else came from. And in my opinion, whether it had to be a license agent that got brought in or the detectives investigating the murder, should have been looking at some culpability of that homeowner who came in and, and misrepresented at the mayor's office that they were having a party. They ran a business that night, an illegal business. They have a house without a sprinkler system with probably one bathroom for 150 people. They want to run a business? Tell them to get a business permit and, 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 and run it. But in our city, we need, Chief, we need you to have those agents. I don't care what it takes at these private parties to go in. You're breaking the law, and you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it once, you're not going to do it twice, and you're not going to do it three times. And I think that homeowner should have had some, again, some punishment, and I'm sure the first punishment is very light, because most punishments are. But at least it gets on the record that we're not going to take this in this city anymore. So as far as you know, the homeowner has not been cited for anything. Right. Councilor, to that point, I think there's the, the common interest between the council, mayor's office, and the police department, or any other department, as well as the residents, that their, this proposal brought before the ordinance committee will hopefully address a better way to form the wheel so that these incidences do not, do not reoccur. And to Councilor Farwell, irrespective of chapter 136, I mean, there will be an issue as to whether or not the city can create an ordinance that's more restrictive than the state statute, uh, or perhaps whether or not the, the matter going before a public forum such as the License Commission then in turn can make a recommendation after it's fully vetted to the mayor for him to make an executory order. So there will be a way to get to our common interest and endpoint on this that'll be far better than <coughs> what we recognize was uh, not the best method, but had been the method historically used for the uh, last so many years. But my, my point is, I mean, first of all, that Chapter 135 was about Sunday entertainment. My neighborhood block party is on a Saturday. I don't recall what permit we've got in the past. We're, we're talking about fixing an issue that is really not the real issue. What we, the real issue is illegal parties. In this case, they represented that it was a block party and we allowed the street to be closed off. That will be the part of, and I don't think it will be a problem superseding 135 because we're actually creating a separate thing that will be called a block party permit and the permit given out won't be chapter 135 or 136. I apologize I'll for not say, I'll be number. happy to work with legislative council in our office to create and design a, um, a, an ordinance that will be effective for what the goals of this council are. Well, I guess my point is, and I agree that we all have a common interest here, my point is that that's one ordinance and it's fine and we'll get that done. That the real issue is not what happened, the real issue is what happened that night, not the block party application. We need to streamline the block party application so we can say, here's what you have to do, here's who, where you get the permit, and it can be shut down anytime. 
That's fine, but that's not really where that problem came from that night. That problem came from somebody running an illegal business with all of the things that go with it. And the reason we have liquor laws is because liquor can be a dangerous thing. And we have, we know when we give out a liquor license who the responsible person is, what they have for responsibility. And we, if there's a, uh, I mean, if you go to light, I mean, obviously you're there quite often at the liquor commission. You know, if there was a fight in your establishment, you're responsible. If there was uh, somebody under 21 being served, you're responsible. When we have people running these illegal parties, there is no responsibility. There's nobody, we don't have anybody that can walk in and say, hey, he's 15 years old and he's drinking. Number one, he's on private property. Did he break the law? Did he not? Well, if he sold, if he paid for it, yes, he broke the law. And we need to start break, uh, clamping down on those people because that's the real problem. I agree not, wholeheartedly. Not the, the fake block party. And we can fix that permit process. But again, that is not what we, we need to start getting. I, I, I'm very disappointed that homeowner has had no, that there's been no punishment to that homeowner. And again, I know that punishment would have been minor, but at least it would have been the city saying, you broke the law and we're going to hold your feet to the fire. Again, it probably would have been almost no punishment, but at least it would have been something. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Any follow-ups? Entertain a motion then. I, 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 because we have something coming out of the ordinance committee at some point, which certainly is relevant to this, I'm going to move to postpone this to uh, a meeting, a second FinCom in October, and uh, and then we can blend the two, and uh, and hopefully come up with the right solution to these issues. Second. Motion on the floor, properly seconded, to postpone this matter to the second FinCom in October. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. It's postponed until the second FinCom in October. Number nine, please. Resolved to invite Brockton Police Chief Mr. John Crowley to discuss operations of the department to the City Council. Invited John Crowley, Chief, Brockton Police Department. Good evening, Chief. Chief, I know there was some emails going around today. I don't know if you were privy to them. Um, Attorney Nazarello did respond to my, to my response as well. Um, just to explain it again, there was a request coming from the city solicitor to have this body, the city council and finance, submit certain um, questions that might be asked of you today. Um, I, I took a, offense to that, that it was not timely. This has been on the agenda actually since July when it was filed. Um, having a, a police officer and a former mayor and also a former police chief uh, we as a body would never ask any questions, first of all, that would compromise or harm your uh, department in any way. I think the basis of this, and this was filed by uh, Council Beauregard, was to ask some, just ask some general questions, information that the constituents are asking us. So if, if there's a question asked tonight and you don't feel comfortable answering, by all means, you don't need to answer it. But I think it's really about asking questions to make sure everybody's on the same page and that there isn't any disconnect in that we're pretty clear. Yes, sir. Is that fine? Yes, sir. Council, this is yours, correct? Well, I'm sorry. I'm seeing that um, Solicitor Nazarella is coming. If I just I may make a statement, Mr. President. We did have emails going back and forth, and uh, I know the Chief had expressed discomfort in the past about uh, this type of open forum. My communication was not to uh, stymie, block, or delay what I think is appropriate issues for the Council not knowing what the questions were, and I wasn't trying to have school teacher type uh, give me your questions first, I was concerned about issues being raised that may turn on the uh, sanctity of public safety. For instance, uh, how much manpower do you have in the northeast section between midnight to eight? Questions like that I don't think would be appropriate, and I didn't want to be in a situation standing up to object as though we're in some type of a courtroom forum. I was simply looking to make sure the, uh, the land mines were clear and there would be nothing inappropriate, not that I would think that would be the intent. So I, uh, again, make uh, mea culpas that we had this last minute exchange, but it dawned on me, I said, I don't want to get into a privileged area, but I do understand and respect the council's issue as uh, to making inquiry as to what the police department operations are. I just didn't know what operations meant. So I'm sure the chief will be capable to respond. I will sit on the sideline, and if I think there is something that we should have concern about, I'll just stand up and make my point. Thank then. you, Attorney Nazarella. And again, this body has always worked with department heads, and, and many times if a question is asked, 
Uh, we don't want to put anybody in the spot. You can always report back to us. If you don't think it's appropriate, by all means, we can talk uh, off record on that. But this was a forum, I believe, that all 11 councillors wanted to ask some questions. It was filed by Councilor Beauregard. So thank you for that, Attorney Nazarella. Uh, Councilor, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Chief, for coming this evening. Yes, there are um, several questions. Remember, we're representing residents of all ages, all backgrounds, and uh, with a, a variety of different concerns. And uh, yes, I use the term operations because it was hard to really pinpoint exactly the, the various um, situations we wanted to address. So first of all, I'll start with way back this uh, spring, or maybe actually was even in the, the winter months, but I had asked uh, to have the crime analyst in front of us to describe information, and my colleagues um, will concur with this, and find out the results of her findings. I had the pleasure of meeting her at one point, and actually when she was just beginning her process. So it would have made one year that she would have been an employee of the city of Brockton, and I'm a strong proponent of this. Now I'm not alone in wanting to know this information, which quite frankly I believe should be available to anyone. And that was one of the reasons. Uh, what took place instead is apparently way up on the chain, uh, a captain, correct, came to represent her. And there were several questions he couldn't answer. The idea was that we wanted these handouts to provide to a, in a constituents with our ward meetings, et cetera, and be able to respond to different individuals. So that was one of our concerns. I have about 11 or uh, 14 questions here, and um, that's, that's be a beginning right there. So. I guess we could start by saying, uh, can, should we file another resolve to have the crime analyst come in front of us? Because I s still believe that we all want to hear from this crime analyst the results, what actions are taken, not necessarily so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that. But if we find that there's a great deal, for example, of crime, I'll state downtown, <coughs> More is there more response? Is there more foot patrols? I'll cite those examples to reaction because that's what people are looking for when they see a very, very large budget going to a particular department. So thank you. I'll start with that. Yes. When she does her research and she determines that there's a large amount of crime in a certain area, we do respond. But okay. Could she, could she appear before us? We could perhaps arrange it. I'm uncomfortable having her come. She's a civilian employee. She's not comfortable in this environment. Um, you know, I'd be uncomfortable with that. Okay. But they, she could meet one-on-one -on -one with counselors. She could, yes. Okay, so I'll go to my next question again, you know, if my colleagues need to chime in. Okay, when um, you were up here for the budget, uh, we had um, actually the superintendent, well, I'm sorry, the superintendent could not make it from uh, the Southeastern Regional School Department, and his uh, first um, in command represented him, and he was the, um, he's a gentleman that oversees the um, Southeastern Regional Tech and Vocational Programs. And one of the things that was mentioned is, I find, and when we had, um, how would I say, a break-in last year, uh, actually, uh, almost a year ago, uh, the police officer didn't have a business card or what have you. And it was told by, to us that, oh, they don't have business cards and they don't um, provide them in the police department. And at that time, the Southeastern Regional uh, individual said, oh, we could provide you with the students printing up those business cards. So I was wondering where we were with the business cards because I know, unfortunately, there have been crimes since then and I'm sure that uh, many, and of course we get the calls, constituents would like to have the name, rank, and information on, on the um, responding officer. I don't recall the, the exact conversation, but if you can provide me the contact information for that person from Southeastern, I will reach out to them. Okay. All right. But to, 
Do yes. police officers have cards to give to residents Some, or no? We do not issue them. You don't no. issue them? They give, tell them their name and their ID. Um, as a matter of practice, we don't assign cards to people. Okay. but They were going to buy their own, but... Do brass? Do, 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 do. Some brass do, some okay. don't. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. My next one has to do with, and I'm not the only one that's had this situation. Again, remember, we're representing the constituents. Uh, the dispatching operators, it seems that, how would I say it? Uh, they appear to come across as they are the deciding factor as to if a police officer will attend to the situation. Uh, I'll cite an example. We have a problem sometimes with a business opening before hours and making a great deal of noise on the border of both a commercial and residential area. And I've called the 504-508-941-0200 number, and I've been told, for example, oh, well, we're not going to send a police officer out because by the time the police officer gets there, they'll be open for business, so then, then it won't be a problem. Um, I, if I'm correct in understanding, and please, if anyone wishes you know, to, to uh, how would I say, you know, um, further uh, expand on this, I'm under the impression, okay, that the dispatching individual that answers the phone is supposed to take the information, because we always hear that this line is being recorded, which I'm grateful for, and that they proceed to provide an officer, a shift supervisor, et cetera, the information, and they, in turn, should be the individuals, how would I say, dispatching the officer or officers. That's correct. That call should have been entered, and why it wasn't, I don't know. Um, okay. But as this, you said, they're all taped. We can listen to the tape and we can find out. Okay. This, this has happened more than once. And like I said, I, I, if it happened once, I'd say, oh, okay, maybe it's my misunderstanding. But remember, we've come across this both personally and uh, with our constituents. Okay. And since um, my colleagues had spent a lot of time discussing, justifiably so, both block parties, illegal parties, and... Um, Again, um, house parties, um, all with the, you know, out, getting out of hand in, in quotes here. Uh, I want to elaborate on that simply because I believe my colleague had brought up at the last meeting when we discussed the illegal party, as we're going to now call it, that uh, it was responded to by the police uh, uh, um, at that time that they said, and I quote, we only received eight calls, end quote, I'm so, about the issue. I'm sorry, but when, uh, I think we need to have a little bit more further clarification on this as to if someone calls once, someone calls twice, w w what happens here? Because when we're talking about noise, and I hadn't even thought of this until someone clarified with me, someone that was a, a police officer at one point um, in his life, said that, Sometimes someone, and I'll, he used this example, can put up the television really loud and they could be beating someone violently. And if you call as the next door neighbor saying, hey, my neighbor has the stereo so loud, I have my television on with my windows closed and I hear it. That's still a noise violation. But I suppose in the grand scheme of things between a serious accident and noise, one has to weigh out. But in the other, other situation, it just seems to be that the attention should be made to that. Chief, could you just explain the process? Like, yes. Council Beauregard, if I, call, if I call that number she said, could you just walk us through briefly what the process is? The person would call the 9410200, that's the non-emergency line, or the 911 line. Uh, emergency telephone dispatch operator would answer the phone, they'd identify themselves and tell you you're being recorded. You'll tell them what their problem is. Um, if it's a serious problem, they'll keep you on the phone, talk to you, stay with you, send the call to the dispatcher, and leave you on the line. If it's something of a uh, non-serious nature, they'll take the information, they'll enter a call. Ideally, that's what should happen. Okay. All right. Okay. 
And um, now um, we're going to get back to traffic. Okay. Um, fortunately, my colleagues this evening had a public safety meeting, and one of the situations that was discussed was speeding. So this is one of, uh, how would I say it, uh, one of the requests that I believe, and again, I'm under the impression that people are relegated to various responsibilities. But should something expand or increase in demand and request, it does the, how would I say, review, is there a review process and saying, all right, we're getting so many calls and so many requests on this particular concern, and I will cite in this case it's speeding. Are we going to see, and I know I'm not supposed to call on this, but I'll, I'll use, you know, because lack of a better term, speed traps, and we'll put that in quotes. Um, we have traffic enforcement officers. It's every police officer's job to enforce the rules, regulations, and traffic laws. Um, they're out there. I mean, just, we all see it. We all drive around. Um, we're doing the best we can. We are out there. We're not ignoring anything. Um, and we try to address the problems as they arise. Okay, because one of, one of the times that we seem to see a great deal of speeding, and this is really disconcerting, is when kids are going to and from school. And, uh, for example, off a side street, well, Court Street I consider a main drag, but uh, I had someone actually talking to me about what they see on Connell Ave, because that becomes a cut through. And so to the point that actually someone was backing out and their car was hit because someone was speeding so along so quickly. So I guess those are um, concerns. Uh, one time someone had called the police actually on a Sunday morning and they found that, um, that the police responded and again this, this seems to be more so with the 9410200 number, so maybe that needs to um, be the concern here. And they said that they were um, overburdened. And then later it was found that they had had 19 calls in two hours. Um, is there like a time when it's considered that we're over, you know, that, that your uh, requests are overwhelmed or that you review certain situations as being extensive? The way our dispatch system works, it works on a stacking system and it prioritizes calls. Okay. Red, yellow, white. A red okay. call is a priority one call, it's going to get dispatched first. Yellow one is a priority two, which is serious but not quite as serious as a priority one. The third level are the white calls and those are the, the loud music calls. Those are where life isn't in danger. Um, and as the calls go off the screen, they move up. Calls that have been sitting for a while, the dispatcher will call them, see if they still have the problem, see if they still want to see the police. Okay, so the dispatcher does call back. Okay. And how long would you say that that takes? Just curious. It's usually over two, after two hours, they'll start calling the people. But you know, right. sometimes so we're there much sooner. It all depends on the volume of calls we're receiving on any given day. Okay, thank you. Okay, and... Um, I think um, one of the other concerns is, uh, you know, again, um, you know, we're, we're dealing a lot with parking and very serious frustrations with people have parked where it says no parking, and uh, this comes up in front of us a lot. And they say, well, people are parking when they're no parking, and they're blocking my driveway, they're doing something like that. So again, that, I imagine, falls under less priority. Yes. Okay. But if we continue, how would I say it? If someone continues calling, let's say it happens on a particular street, is there more, how would I say it, as, as somebody relegated to maybe, I don't know, um, you know, peruse the neighborhood more closely or something of that nature? It all depends on how busy that sector is at any given time. Um, the okay. officer, you know, could see a, a, a violation and go back the next day and see if he sees it again, but it all depends on... Oh. Again, how busy he is. So when you use the term sector, you mean a particular shift or something? What the office's patrol area assignment is. Okay. Okay. Patrolling area. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, how, uh, I guess now um, we've been talking about this quality of life. Uh, apparently, uh, the, you have police officers that work with Board of Health. Yes. Okay, because um, that's also, how would I say, uh, you know, becoming more of a concern. 
and apparently we're getting some really positive you know, work done on this and the quality of life um, situations where, again, we have uh, neighbors that necessarily don't respect other neighbors and there's various violations or there's, uh, how would I say, conditions, okay, I'll, I mean, I'll cite one. We have abandoned property on a particular street. It is now, you know, just gone into foreclosure and, you know, it has to go through such a, you know, a number of steps so that it'll eventually be available for sale again. But meanwhile, neighbors choose to, how would I say it, use the driveway, bring their trash over to that particular abandoned home, or, and uh, use the driveway, I should be saying, not just to park, but to fix cars, wash um, their cars in that driveway or something like that. Again, I imagine that falls under the 941. It would all depend on what they're doing. Uh, I mean, if, if the house may appear abandoned to you, the neighbor, but it's probably owned by a bank, so it has an owner. So we, you don't, we don't necessarily know they're trespassing because we can't get in contact with that person. Um, if okay. the trash issue, you would contact the health department. If, yes. if it's vacant and they're getting in, you call the big building department and have them arrange to get in and seal it. Um, okay, all right, the building department. I hadn't thought of that one. But okay, no, th so trespassing, because someone owns it and you can't get a hold of them, your hands are tied? Is that? Basically, I mean, we need someone that has control over that property to tell us that person is not welcome here. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to defer to my, my colleagues at this point. Um, if Chief, just to follow up, relative to the, uh, to the traffic, and I always see the, uh, the offices out there, uh, are the Stadies still working in collaboration on that as well? I know in the past, State Police had as well. Yes, that's yes they, are. they the, are. The CAT team during the weekend is, right. is okay. still here. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Fowler had a question, and then Councilor Ian Airy, and then Councilor Bonds. A actually, I, I don't have a question. I have a couple of brief statements. Sure. John, you're kind of a mysterious figure because you're not out in the community and as well known as we are, and a lot of people don't realize that you're a really great guy. I wish you were a little more like me, though, because if I had a three-year contract ending in May of 2020, I'd make an appointment with the mayor, and I'd go in and see him, and he's, he's known as the ultimate micromanager, and I don't say that in a derogatory sense. He just likes to manage everybody and manage everything, and I would say, Mr. Mayor, I appreciate the faith and trust you've placed in me. I will do my very best job for you. I will carry out any policies that you want carried out, but I'm going to be in charge of the police department. I'm going to manage it day by day. I'm going to decide where people should be assigned. I'm going to decide what code enforcement activities are carried out and how they're carried out. I'm going to have traffic enforcement. I'm going to do the things that as a professional public safety manager I know should be done in this city. Now, I don't expect you to do it because it would probably be the wrath of God for a while if you did. But, but, uh, but the one thing I want to tell you is you can't be terminated except, as I understand it, a two-thirds vote of this council. Even though the mayor signed your contract, it would take a two-thirds vote of the city council to remove a department head. And I can almost speak with great assurance, knowing the people in this room, that if you embraced the police practices and management practices that are necessary, we would stand behind you to the nth degree, and you would be all right. Because the last part of my statement is, as much as I love everyone at 7 Commercial Street, and I was there. And there will always be in my blood a little bit of cop, even though I'm well retired. I can't be blinded by the love and respect I have and not tell you that something is not right. I hear it in too many places. People in this community feel that we have a great police department, but they feel disconnected. They feel as though that when they call, there always seems to be a delay or someone doesn't show up. I mean, I've even heard it from some of my colleagues that they get the same complaints. And I don't know whether it's training. I don't know whether it's sensitivity. But I, I really would urge you and, and the command staff to somehow imbue a greater sensitivity to the officers that when you're out there on patrol, Stop the cruiser and talk to a couple of kids. Ask them how they're doing. Tell them, hey, you may not like cops, but you know what? If you need help, I'll be, the, I'll be there for you. Stop and talk to residents. 
you know, driving around is great, visibility is great, but as we know in politics, the personal touch is what really gets to people. And if we can't answer a call, someone calls in and says, hey, my kid's bike got stolen, uh, and we know we're not going to get there for an hour, tell the person up front. I think part of the problem is that when they call, there's no feedback. Yeah, well, we'll what's your name, what's your address, what's your phone number, we'll be up. But tell them, let, you know, be customer service oriented and let people know because I really believe the citizens will stand behind a delay if they know what know they're it. facing. And uh, I don't expect you to react to this tonight. Um, if I hear a rumor that you want match yourself in to see the chief, <laughs> I'll be very happy and I think we'll stand behind you. But, but I, really, I really do hope as we go forward. Um, of all of the calls that someone makes in their entire lifetime, they've got to believe that if they call the police, we're going to be there for them. Absolutely. And if we leave the impression that, well, we may be there, well, we really don't have enough people, well, we wish we had more overtime money, uh, we're going to lose it because we, we really heavily depend upon the support of the public. And I, I would just ask you to factor that into all of the things you do and to the extent that you can increase uh, the awareness of the officers that we have to be on the side of the citizens, all citizens. I don't care whether you've been here a day or a hundred years. You know, we've got to be there for them, and they've got to know that. We're there for them, but I'm not sure people understand that. And, uh, I, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Council E. Neary, followed by Council Bonds, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good evening, Chief, and uh, thank you for coming in to answer some of the questions that uh, some of my colleagues have. Unfortunately, I couldn't get here in time tonight for the meeting. I think you were present for the first meeting as well, um, which was discussion of uh, traffic control, which is something I brought to the Public Safety uh, Subcommittee um, you know, to start to discuss and see what we could do. And it, it is very um, very close and dear to, to me that we try to do whatever we can. I know we're doing what we can, but I think we just need to do some other steps in, in, in controlling traffic. And, and uh, I would like to see us at some time in the future to, to really begin to look at more of, of a traffic control division than almost than having a traffic commission sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Seeing more vehicles appointed to traffic um, yeah, it, it is going crazy through the city. I think you, you know this, and you and I have had discussion of this a couple of times as well. Um, but it's just getting to a fact that, that some of the neighborhood streets are just, you know, people are just concerned. They're upset, and, and it's, it's happening more often than ever in some of these neighborhood streets, and even the ones within my area. And, you know, I'm hearing as I've been out there, naturally, the last few weeks, you know, I've been out there. So, you know, as much as I'm invisible, but I am out there. Um, you know, and people are saying to me, you know, traffic control, it's a, it's a big issue. We've got more traffic on our neighborhood streets than we ever had before. People know shortcuts. Well, God, you and I know shortcuts, too, you know, but we travel the right way. But that's the concern I have. So um, I just hope that, you know, in the, in, in the next few weeks or months or so, maybe we can start to really look at what can we do, you know, to put another couple of vehicles on. Um, and if we need the vehicles, I mean, I don't think there'd be anybody on this floor that would be resentful to the fact that, you know, if we had extra monies to appropriate, you know, when it comes to police department, fire department, I'm all there. I'm with you. You know what I'm saying? And, and if that's what we need to do, you know, hopefully we can do that. But that, that's one thing I just echo out to you. Um, I mean, as, as for other things, I mean, you know, I, 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 I firmly believe you're doing a, you're, you're doing an omen's job and trying to get things get things done. And, and yes, yeah, staffing is an issue, no doubt. Staffing is an issue in the fire department, no doubt. But um, you know, I commend you for what you're trying to do. I commend the men and women that we have in the police department for, for what they're doing as well, because uh, it's not easy today. It's it's a difficult task. So um, just I just want to keep. You know, I want you to keep that in mind as we continue on traffic control because, uh, and, and I only use one street because it's the, it's West Chestnut Street that's given me the big headache every single day. I hear about it every single day, and rightfully so. And you and I both travel it, and you know it as well. But um, it, it's, um, it, it's something we have to start to like, l l really take a hard look at, not just in my area, but throughout the whole city as well. But uh, I just appreciate you keeping that thought in your head. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Bonds, followed by Council Lally, please. Thank you. Uh, Chief, just one question, really. Uh, Councilor Borgad mentioned about the, uh, the time at the budget hearing. So I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out now, because I recall a few years ago around this time, around October or so, um, there was some requests for more funding in the overtime. So I just wanted to find out where, where are we with spending on that line item at this point? 
at this point we're on par. Oh, okay. On par for requesting more of <laughs> finishing up the year. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but it's it's under control and on the last manageable? report, yes. I'm sorry. The last report I received, yes. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Do you anticipate with the winter months uh, coming up there being some, I guess, like hits in there, or, or I, I guess, are there trends in certain months and times when overtime is more, more vacations? Sick, Some are typically injured. we use more. Um, Some are use more, okay. In vacation time, but you know, the nature of police work is we never know one when we're actually going to be able to leave work because you're going to have a call, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we never know when there's going to be a tragic event that we have to use multiple resources. So, the overtime is something you can't really plan for. It just it comes when it comes. Um, we're trying to keep our thumb on it. Okay, okay, and you're asserting that you're doing a good job the department is working together to keep it under control we're watching it yes okay oh great um and just something to uh counselor Fowles uh, point about people calling and um not really feeling heard or not having a response i've been trying to call to report um a business here in the city that i feel could potentially put folks at danger and i've called um the officer that deals with that particular, I guess, review or investigation four times and left three messages and I've not had any, any response back. And the last message I left was I was in pretty significant distress. Um, so I guess my question is, well, that's, that's the, you know, pro, pro, the preview to my question, but how effective are those voicemails? Do, do they check them? Like what, what, where do those voicemails go? They're supposed to check them, whether or not they check them or not. Uh, I know the detectives check theirs regularly. Sometimes a patrolman, I can't speak for them, but you know, they may not check them as regularly. I don't, I don't know what you're, who you're trying to contact or what your complaint was. But well, I don't want to put them it, out there, but. No, I understand that. And if it's something that, you know, call my office and I, and I can address it for you. Okay, I even went to the station, actually. I went there to file a report, and then come to find out it wasn't report up, like, fileable or whatever, but I did get good treatment when I got there. Right. I mean, if, if, if it's a patrol issue and a patrolman, call and ask for a shift supervisor. I mean, no, it was, I was told to call the detectives for this particular person, and I, like I said, I called, called four times, left three messages, and then in between that, I actually went down to the station. Um, and I've not had any response from anybody about it at all. And like I said, this business potentially could be putting people at risk. Um, so that's... You could provide me with that after or I okay. can... I can find okay, an and there was something else too. <coughs> I forget, but... Um, oh, yes! Citizens Police Academy. It came back and then it went away. Are we, are we on track to have that again? I can I can check with the education community education unit to see they did do one. Um, yeah. They started one with the clergy. Um, That's nice. And there could be one of the plans. Okay. They probably haven't scaled it yet because of the summer months. Oh. But okay. Now that That's we're right. getting back to our routines again, um, there may be one in the planning stage. Super. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Lally, followed by Councilor Rodriguez, please. All right. I'll be I'll be quick. I promise. Um, one thing, you know, while, while it's up here and I don't want to throw more, throw more stuff at you, but I, I do get a lot of calls myself from constituents about, uh, speeding concerns in my, in my area. And I know that, um, it would be optimal to have, you know, quite a few more officers than we have now. Uh, but would it be possible, and I know, you know, we can't cover speeding everywhere, everywhere, but would it be possible to, you know, leave an empty police cruiser on the side of one of these roads, you know, maybe one that's out for some reason or another, uh, you know, just to park it there. People will, I've, you know, people will start to slow down before they realize that, that nobody's in it. It'll have the same, it'll have, you know, the same effect. Anyone goes by going too fast. You know, they, they, they won't get ticketed or anything, but the vast majority of people will slow right down. Usually they do. Um, 
if you continue to park it there, and then everyone notices that it's just parked there, and then there's nobody in it, so it yeah. loses its effectiveness. Well, move, moving it around every couple of days, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this spot, that spot. We're not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, you gave away the secrets now. Oh, I apologize. The jig is up. Yep. Um, and off of, off of uh, Councillor Farwell's point, uh, when I was in high school, I was, you know, I was walking down North Montello Street, and a police officer pulled over, got out of the car, introduced, uh, introduced herself, said, you know, we're, we're here if there's anything coming up, you know, just... Just give us a call, gave us all her card, and got back in the car and went on her day. And I can still, I can still remember that instance, uh, you know, to this day. So it, it can have a, uh, a long-lasting positive, uh, impact, positive, effect. positive impact for that. I agree. Yeah. When, the, when was that, last week? Actually, See, two weeks ago. Okay, two See, that's weeks ago. not right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yes, okay. Council, I will say to your idea, um, I saw Brockton police, school police officer Danny Vaughn have his cruiser near the Kennedy School when the kids and the light was on, and it definitely was a deterrent for people that fly down at, kind of close to, to, yeah. So, I mean, it's a good idea, and I know it's being... It works. It's, it, absolutely. But you're right. If they see an empty cruiser, it might have a... Right. After I mean, a while. Um, the chair. Con yeah. Actually, off of that, when I, when I first campaigned for office in 2015, I drove a uh, Grand Marquis. And when I'd park it on the side of main streets, people would complain about speeding and they'd gesture out to the street and everyone would be following the speed limit because they thought it was a cruiser parked on the side <laughs> of the road. Until they saw the big elect lally sticker. Yeah, the like, no, 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 I, I, I swear, it's, I swear they usually speak. Yeah. Menacing looking. <laughs> Are you done, Council? <laughs> yeah. Council Rodriguez, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, one, of the one of the concerns or complaints that we, at least I, constantly here is that our police chief is not very visible in the community I hear this all the time I mean people are used to seeing um, Commissioner Evans anytime there's some sort of a, a neighborhood issue in Boston um, you always see the the, the, the police chief uh, Davis before that uh, frankly constituents and people residents they don't want to see politicians they don't want to see us they want to see the police, the head of police, because it somehow it sends a, a calming uh, message to the community in time of crisis. And it, as an advice to you, I think you need to be a little more visible. I know our mayor likes to be in front of cameras and you know being out there doing his thing, but when there's a shooting or there's a killing or there's a, a major accident, I think honestly people would feel a lot more comfortable in not seeing me or the mayor or any other the other councils here but the police chief and I don't know exactly what the deal is going back to what council Fowell was saying you know no one is one to, no one wants to tell you how to do your job in a way but we're just sharing this stuff with you because to me if the city feels uh, more safe and secured it makes our jobs a lot easier as well so um, just a little more visibility in the sense in time of crisis, I think would be, uh, would be wonderful, you know? Um, I know it's gonna be hard for you to crack, you know, certain uh, existing stereotypes that exist within this, within this government, but I think it would actually uh, uh, do wonders for the department and for yourself. I understand. Uh, in addition to that, when, you, when Chief Crowley is out of town, on vacation, who is in charge of the police department? Usually Captain Williamson. Williamson. So technically, if we have any issues on anything, we should contact uh, Captain Williamson. If you can't find me, he, I'm would, be, if you're out of he town, would be your if point you're on of contact. Vacation, if you're on vacation. Uh, and my last point is that we hear now that Pretty soon we will have the most members in the police department that we've had in quite some time. At least, I think, in my lifetime. We're getting there, yes. Uh, but I remember back in the 90s when things were tight and people were being laid off everywhere. That's when we implemented the, or maybe in the 80s. Uh, maybe I've got my, and it's been so many years that I can't tell the years apart anymore. But when we implemented the uh, bicycle patrols and a lot of the foot patrols in the downtown area, in the Campello and Montello uh, side of things, the walking beats back in the days. Somehow that 
it doesn't equate, I mean, it doesn't compute, as they would say. If we have the least number of officers, yet we have all these additional stuff going on, and yet now we're pretty close to having the most officers we've ever had, I think the, uh, the issues of having more visibility in the, in the community should be a non-issue. When do you foresee fully implementing both, you know, foot patrols, bike patrols, community policing in a way that it used to be done so that there's a lot more visibility? Because if we've got the numbers, there's no reason why we can't do that. No, I, I agree. Um, we have the foot patrols, they're back. They've been back all summer. We have the bicycle patrols and been out all summer. Um, we're currently doing all that. But you, when you say bicycle, you don't mean motorcycle. You mean no, bike, bike? Pedal, pedal bicycles. Pad okay. Because one of the issues there that are I hear. Some motorcycles around. But what I hear, one of, one of the things that I hear is that the motorcycle guys are more for show than anything else. I mean, they don't do any, any, um, any traffic enforcement, for instance. Um, and you know what? I, I think that came out in terms of. You know, we got to do what we can with the resources that we have. You know, I think it should be all hands on deck in the sense to deal with the issues in the streets. And I think you, you've told us once upon a time ago that uh, there's a great deal of arrests that come out of traffic stops. Absolutely. You know, so I think it just makes abs absolutely very little sense for a police now that's bigger than it's been in a long time not to have a lot more of that, the so-called stopping uh, and, and talking to the people in the streets and and having a lot, a lot more of the uh, the foot patrols that we had back in the days when uh, when things didn't when when help didn't exist as it is nowadays. And again, be a little more visible because I think it makes a big difference. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for the Chief? I just had one question. Oh, sure. Okay. Chief, I just had a question. Um, several years ago, it was actually before you were Chief, and I think before Manny Gomes. I think it was Bill Conlon was the Chief. I, I might be off on that, but. Um, there was a, an influx of pedestrian accidents, and Mr. Yancey was killed on Belmont Street, yes. unsolved to this day. Um, and I filed a resolve at that time, different council, different membership, um, to try to change the speed limit on certain streets, major throwaways, much like Marty Walsh has done in, in, in Boston, and, and, and uh, Dave Murphy over in Randolph has done the same. Um, and the pushback, to my amazement, was that we couldn't do it because a lot of the roads are state roads but also it would cost us too much to actually replace the street signs in Brockton, which I thought was ludicrous. So I'm just asking, I'm not trying to hold your feet to the fire, but do you think that's something that the city, the city council, the mayor, the police, we should revisit that again? Do you think that that would have a benefit or potential help um, relative to speeding and accidents and the like? It's, it's, it's hard, to, hard to really quantify it. Um, when we went back, when I knew I was coming to the public safety tonight, I researched the number of pedestrian and bicycle accidents we've had. Um, this year we've had 71. 75 percent of those are the pedestrian or bicyclist fault. It's almost, they need education. I mean, you drive, walk down the road, drive down the road, the bicycles are on the wrong side. People are crossing, not on the crosswalks, but out of the crosswalks. Um, out of the 25 percent that uh, were cited, and were the operator's fault, none of them were charged with speeding. They were charged with other resulting uh, motor vehicle offenses. Um, some probably not even involved in the accident, but they received a ticket that day. Okay. Um, I think the start is to educate the public on the safety and the right way to do things. Um, and I don't have any, I don't really know if they're lowering the speed limit. It seems to be such a, a massive problem that you know, I don't know how low you go. Thank you for that. And then also just on behalf of Council Bonds, Fowler, and Rodriguez, we, we do these quarterly at-large meetings, and we're going to be having one relatively soon at-large councils. So we'd like to invite you to attend. It's a very informal session. So if you'd like to join us, we'd be happy to see you there. Absolutely. We'll give you a formal written invite. Council, do you have any? Yes, I just want, wanted okay. to wind this down. Thank you very much, Chief, for coming this evening. I think we've all brought up the fact that it's visibility and communication. And again, because our residents want to have a police officer be receptive to their concerns. And I realize on the grand scheme of things sometimes, some of the concerns are not as, how would I say, intense and serious as others. But they're part of making it a safe, 
community for everyone. And, uh, you know, we have some really great police officers out there. They've been really wonderful. And I guess, again, the, the mention was, okay, somebody calls the 941-0200. Okay, people are parked on my street. They're blocking us from getting out. Somebody responds, okay, we, we have a couple of accidents here. We will be there. We apologize for the delay. Something of that nature, more of a, a receptive situation. We have a large elderly population, and they're afraid, and we want them to feel that uh, they can be safe in this city. And again, the visibility, the response, just the way someone approaches approaches. The, the, you know, the concern is, is everything. So thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you out in the community, responding with my colleagues, you know, next month when they do their um, at large. And again, you're always welcome. I'm having a Ward 5 meeting next Tuesday night, 7 p.m. at Plouffe Academy at 250 um, Crescent Street. Love to have you or another police officer to be there. Sometimes people feel better just taking you in the corner and saying this. And if anybody wants to reach you, how best can they do that, you, yourself? Just call my office, 897-508-9753-50. 897-508-9753-50. Five three five zero, and it's going to have a recording that said that you have oh, reached the. My administrative assistant will answer. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Did, did I, we, it's we eight nine seven five three five. Eight nine seven. Okay. <laughs> Chief, we want to thank you for being here. Also, again, Attorney Nezarel, thank you. Um, we also want to thank you for having Officer Healy here in the chamber. Uh, it really is. Uh, we talked about this with prior administrations. Kind of fell on deaf ears. It's, it's, it's a good thing for any constituent and all of us to have him here. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that as well. Yes, sir. Entertain a motion. Okay. Yes, I uh, resolve to uh, move this favorably. Second. 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 Motion made properly. Second. Favorable recommendation back to the council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Favorable recommendation back to the full council. We're going to go on to number 10. It's going to be read, and then I'm just going to ask for a postponement. Okay. Resolve to invite Ms. Jean Martineau, Director of the Brockton Employees Retirement Board, to introduce herself and give the City Council a brief synopsis of any anticipated changes to those receiving benefits at this time. Invited Jean Martineau, Director of Brockton Employees Retirement Board. Councilors, so Mr. Martineau sent me a, a letter, a formal letter, uh, explaining she is unable to attend here tonight. As you may recall, during the budget, she came before us, she was new, she said she wanted to come back and give us more information. I guess now isn't the time. Um, she missed it last last time because she was on vacation. So I am going to entertain a motion. This is your resolve, but I think you need to push it out November or so. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, we're, I'm going to ask to table this. Table. I spoke with uh, the director, the new director, uh, Jean Martineau. Okay, so I want people to realize a few things that are taking place. First of all, they've hired another individual. She's recent <clears throat> to the position herself. They're doing a huge system computer in, to internal change. And they're really, how would I say it, changing the way that they do certain things. So in the future, in 2018, there will be a newsletter. It will be available to retirees, I guess, future retirees, both online and, I guess, being able to be mailed. At, at present, they have a website, BrocktonRetirement.com. They had moved last year to 1322 Belmont Street, Suite 101. You are welcome there if you are a retiree, a future retiree, Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. There are individuals there prepared to answer your questions and your concerns. You can call them if you wish to make an appointment at 508-580-7847. At that point, when I spoke to the director, uh, we had noticed that the phone number was not on the city's website. It now is with all the other departments, and also there's a link to the website. And on the website, there's a frequently asked questions that people want to know about. And also, they're working on being open one night a week for those that are going to retire that have questions and all, needs all the documents they need to prepare, et cetera. So the, go the goal is to be more prepared in 2018 with a new system that they're now doing the conversion of. And they're all actually having a specialist come in. They refer to them as actuary 
stories to review and uh, present, and uh, they're prepared to come to us in uh, late, um, how do I say, late spring of 2018 with all the information. So thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chair, and I would- Johnson, uh, before we get a second on the table, because after that, under Robert's rules, we can't talk, so hold that second. Um, remember, this will stay on the table, it will die because the legislative yes. session oh, yes, ends, and then come January, um, the council can entertain it to file it again under that new legislative session. Okay, motion on the motion's been the table is print properly second. All in favor? All opposed, motion carries. The matter is tabled. Um, if we could uh, go to 11, please, just read it into the record. Yep. Resolved to invite Timothy Sorry. Cruz to appear before a committee of this council to update the committee on current crime rates, the Safe Streets Collaborative, and the current state of cooperation between the many public safety partners currently active in the city of Brockton, including all state and federal agencies to also enlighten this council on any other issues that may be of interest to this council. Invited Timothy J. Cruz, District Attorney, Plymouth County. Councilor Timothy Cruz. <laughs> Thank you very much. I filed this resolve after a conversation with the District Attorney, and he was very excited about coming in to talk to us all about some of the things that are going on that as the lead law enforcement official in the county he oversees. Uh, he was prepared for Monday night and didn't realize we had a little bit of a different schedule this uh, <laughs> week. I am going to make a motion to postpone this to the October 16th. Uh, or is that Columbus Day? No. No. We'll be meeting on the 16th? Columbus Day, no. Hey, the 8th must be Columbus yeah, Day, Columbus correct? Day. Yeah, I think, yep, we'll be here so on the 16th. To postpone until the October 16th finance meeting. Second. Motion made properly. Second, postpone this matter until the October 16th uh, finance. All in favor? All opposed, motion carries. Postpone until October 16th, please. Last agenda item of the evening. Resolved to have representatives of the Brockton Partnership, an informal group of businesses, come before the City Council to talk about the reason they have come together and the potential purpose. Invited Robert F. Rivers, Chairman and CEO, Eastern Bank, Christopher Cooney, President and CEO, Metro South Chamber of Commerce, John Marion, Tuxedos by Marion, Mary Waldron. Councilors, I filed this resolve along with uh, Ward 2 Councilor Monahan and Mr. Monahan, do you want to say anything for the record? Uh, yes, that they'd like to um, reschedule this to the second finance in November. They had some scheduling conflicts November? with November? Yes. November? Second. Really? Okay. Motion on the floor to postpone until the second FinCom in November. All in favor? All opposed, that motion carries. November, second FinCom. Hmm? Uh, I do, first of all, on behalf of the Finance Committee, want to thank Connie Costa, our clerk, for. Uh, working with us tonight, it's a late night. I didn't know it was gonna go this late. And also for really working, she works diligently on the summer sessions relative to lining up the agenda. So thank you for that, Connie. And also a comment was made tonight by the mayor that one of our colleagues must have too much time on his hands or has a lot of time um, to review Mass General Law. And I'm very thankful as the chairman of the Finance Committee that Wynn Farwell does review Mass General Law. I think it's very valuable for this body. So keep doing what you're doing, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> uh, anything else before us tonight? Uh, Mr. President. Councilman Monaghan. <coughs> Chairman. A uh, moment of personal privilege? Yes, sir. Um, I'm doing this for Shirley, <laughs> and she'll kill me if I don't. Um, this uh, Friday, September 22nd to Sunday, September 24th, the Lebanese Festival will be, will be held at St. Teresa's Church on Main Street. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Monaghan. Councilman Beauregard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A moment of personal privilege Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Okay, we, we all remember the Ward 5 meeting, and everyone is invited, and I look forward to seeing my colleagues uh, attend and speak. When is uh, it again, Council? Uh, Tuesday, September 26, 7 p.m., Pluff Academy. Uh, I just want to mention two things. I mean, there's no doubt in our minds that there's so many remarkable people in this community, and it was highlighted that uh, here's this young man that uh, went with the Red Cross here, Andrew Enos, and uh, Hurricane Harvey, and then turned around to uh, attend to Hurricane Irma. Mind you, this young man is 19 years old, and here he was working with all these emergency first responders. And it just uh, it, it speaks to the, um, one of the many remarkable people that are part of this community. And I also want to point out that I did attend the meetings for um, both the Board of Health and the Water Commission for this month. The Water Commission had uh, made their statement that we were still under uh, water um, advisory. And of course, maybe that'll change after all the rain we've had, but just wanted to bring that part up. 
everyone is always invited to these meetings. Any one of these meetings, they're open to the public. And I also wanted to mention that the Board of Health was still uh, working on the, um, how would I say it, the community garden slash urban farming resolve and uh, how many chickens and other uh, fowl and animals uh, that you can have in um, your homes. It will be available. It will be also open to the public. Again, that meeting is always open to the public to attend. So again, thank you. Thank you, Council. Anything else? Councilors, uh, we will see you Monday night, 8 o'clock, full city council here in the chamber, the 25th this coming Monday. Have a good evening. Thanks, Connie.